anything but. The musings of an outcast. Me, Raspberry Sweet. Raspberry Sweet, Book One. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by A.J. Carter. Prologue June 7th, Tin York High School Just one more day, I think to myself. I keep my head down and dodge all the seniors in their letter jerseys, the cheerleaders hanging on their arms, not looking at the band geeks or the goths or the nerds milling about in the cafeteria. Just one more day and I have a whole summer away from this hellhole. I don't want to be here. I would rather douse myself in lava than spend one more hour in the Tin York High School cafeteria, but I have no choice. I try to remain as invisible as possible while heading toward my usual empty table in the back, which is thankfully tucked into a corner that no one notices. It's so embarrassing sitting by yourself every day. I consider eating lunch in the bathroom again, but rule that idea out immediately. I can only do that so many times before one of the jocks will catch me, and then I really won't hear the end of it. I'm a sophomore this year, and it's been awful getting through it. I can't imagine wasting two more years here, at a place where I learn nothing and am treated worse than. Just keep your eyes forward, I think. Don't look at anything and don't talk to anyone. Just one more day. Hey, Moldy! A voice cries out. What's the hurry? I hold back a groan. Of course. Why not? This is their last day to pick on me for the year, and they aren't going to let me get away without making sure I'm completely miserable. Moldy! I'm talking to you! The voice says again. The biggest asshole of the school, Cayman Markey, steps in front of me and blocks the path to my table. His trained apes surround me, and the cafeteria goes quiet. Even though Cayman torments me every day, apparently it only gets more entertaining because the whole school always stops to watch. I partly blame myself. It's too easy to pick on me. I have no friends. Honestly, who would want to be friends with someone who listens to show tunes on the bus and memorizes Broadway plays on Saturday nights instead of getting drunk like the rest of them? My biggest dream is to be an actor. I tried so hard to conceal that secret throughout the year. But Cayman could smell people who were different, and he'd made sure everyone knew what a freak I was for wanting to memorize lines instead of throw a ball around. Like he's doing right now. I glance upward. What do you want, Cayman? I just wanted to say goodbye. He smiles, and his friends laugh. Summer starts tomorrow. I want to make sure you remember me. I can never forget you, Cayman, I say bluntly. Personally, I'm surprised you're graduating this year. I thought for sure they'd have to hold you back. The crowd gasps. Cayman's smile falls. I can't help it. If he's going to bully me on the last day, I might as well go out with a bang. I'm really tired of never sticking up for myself. Time to fight back. Cayman takes a step forward. Did you really say that, Mildred? Inwardly, I wince. Why didn't my parents have to choose such a shitty name? It's old world and traditional, my mother sniffs inside my head. Right, like that helps me now. I look down at my tray and say, I just want to eat lunch. Give me some peace. Give you a piece? Cayman says, laughing. He grabs the slice of raspberry cake I have on my tray and says, Sure, if that's what you want. He shoves it in my face. The icing smears all over the side of my cheek and falls limply to the floor with a splat. Cayman lets out a loud laugh and says, Huh? You like that? You like that, raspberry sweet? How cute, Cayman. A pun on my last name, I say dully. Maybe if I pretend I'm a robot and don't have any feelings, he'll leave me alone. It's unlikely. I don't think he heard me, Cayman says. He turns in a circle. He picks up another piece of cake off of some guy's plate and smashes it onto my forehead. Let's hear it for Raspberry Sweet! The jocks in the circle start throwing their food at me, grunting and hooting. Cayman pushes me into a collection of chairs. I slam against the floor, trying to cover my head. 
Soon, the entire cafeteria has me surrounded in a circle. They're pelting me with cake. The frosting is coating my clothes, my hair, everything. They're chanting, Raspberry sweet! Raspberry sweet! I don't know why, but I can't think of anything except how awful it is they're wasting so much food. Then, someone speaks up. I know this is a marvel idea for you, Cayman, but why don't you pick on someone whose brain is the same size as yours? At the voice, I dare to look up. Bethany Cade. She lives with her grandparents on the wrong side of town, and anyone can tell you she's trouble. She spends more time in the principal's office than she does in class. She has stark blonde hair covered in a black skater's cap and is wearing black baggy pants with chains on them. There are about a million rubber bracelets on her arms. She's only fifteen, but she already has a lip piercing and a nose ring. I heard a rumor she even has a tattoo. She's a sophomore, like me. Even I know well enough to stay away from her. So why is she challenging Cayman? The cafeteria freezes. The name-calling stops. Bethany pushes her way past the jocks and kneels by me. Oh, that's right, Bethany says, glaring up at Cayman. You can't pick on someone with the same size brain because finding another moron like you would be completely impossible. Stay out of this. It's none of your business, Cayman sneers. It damn well is my business when you're turning the cafeteria into a fucking zoo, she shoots back. She helps me to my feet and whispers, Are you okay? I'm fine, I mumble back. I'm so embarrassed. Cayman points and says, You need girls to stick up for you now? What a loser! Bethany raises an eyebrow. I'm pretty sure me and my ovaries could kick your ass any day. You're asking for it, Cayman says, and he cracks his knuckles. Who's gonna hurt me? You and your frat boy clone army? Bethany asks, and she lets out a loud laugh. Cayman starts toward her, raising a fist. Unflinching, Bethany pulls a switchblade from her pocket. Cayman leaps back. The jocks cower against each other as the blade glints in the light. Nobody makes a move. That's what I thought, she says. She pockets the knife, turns on her heels arrogantly, and walks away. Under her breath, she mutters, There are always little bitches when you stand up to them. You aren't going to get away with this, Cade, Cayman threatens. You can't have a knife on school grounds. I'll tell the principal and you'll be expelled the second he sees you. Oh, boo-hoo. Being banned from this place forever? That's such a punishment, Bethany says, rolling her eyes. She jerks her head at me. Come on, let's go. Even though I have no connection to Bethany whatsoever, I follow her. All eyes are on us as we leave the cafeteria. Bethany kicks her locker and falls against it with a sigh. What a jerk, she says, shaking her head. I knew he wasn't going to do anything to me. He doesn't have the balls. She looks my way. I don't actually know you. I've never seen you before. I usually skip lunch. Don't feel bad. Nobody knows me, I say, and I shrug. I try to stay out of sight. Well, that's the problem, she says. You don't have a reputation. You need to make a name for yourself. I'm just trying to blend in, I say meekly. Being invisible is the only way to stay safe. She glances at me, biting a nail. You need to be somebody, even if it's a lie. Don't give a damn who they are. That way, they can't hurt you. She holds out her hand. I'm Bethany, by the way. I stare at her outstretched hand before an idea pops into my head. Raspberry sweet, at your service. I grab her hand and shake it with a smile, before giving her a low bow. You don't have to call yourself that. Those guys were assholes, Bethany says quickly. No, I insist. As weird as it sounds, I kinda like it. Sorta... Gives me power over them, I guess. I'm taking an insult they used against me and wearing it as my armor. That way, they can't hurt me. She gives me a look that suggests I'm slightly insane. You can't really expect me to call you Raspberry. Just call me Ras, I say, liking how quickly the name clicks in my head. Anything's better than Mildred. Bethany smiles. 
Well, Raz, she says, and she spreads her arms out wide. Welcome to the best summer of your life. Chapter 1 September 6th, Limesville, Connecticut Raz! Raz, you get up! I flinch and pull away as somebody shakes me. My six-year-old cousin Mitzi hits me across the shoulder in a pointless attempt to get me out of bed. I moan and pull the covers over my head. Needless to say, I'm not a morning person. Wake up, Raz! She shouts again. It's the first day of school! Go away, you little menace. Get your gang and terrorize somebody else, I grumble. If you don't move it, your butt's gonna miss the bus. And since we all know you can't drive yet. All right, all right, I'm up, I shout. My family's never going to let me live it down, are they? In the darkness of my dreams, I'd forgotten everything. Of course my permit is suspended. Could I forget why? Mitzi smiles. She's a little terror, a pigtailed brunette with large, pale blue eyes. She looks like an innocent kitten, but her disposition is one of a saber-toothed tiger. Once she's gone, I slam my door and go back to bed. I don't want to get up. I don't want to get out of bed, ever. I just want to lie here until I turn to stone or die. Either is acceptable. I'm so damn numb. It's not long before Aunt Sarah comes barging in. Raz, you've got a half an hour before the bus gets here. What exactly are you doing in that bed? Uh, sleeping, I mumble. Up, she demands. When I don't move, she sighs and yanks off the covers. Without a second's hesitation, I sit up and pull them back. Get up, Raz, she says, yanking on the blankets again. No way, I say and yank them back just as hard. She lets go. I fall backwards and smack my head against the wall. I groan and rub the back of my head while she stands there with a triumphant smile. Great, you're up. Now get moving. You now have 25 minutes. Groggily, I finally roll out of bed. I stumble to my dresser as my aunt leaves the room, scanning the piles of clothes on the carpet for something to wear. The first day of school. Great. Just what I've been looking forward to. After the previous incident back in Tin York over the summer with Bethany Cade, my mortified parents had shipped me off to live with my aunt and uncle in a place called Limesville, Connecticut. Limesville. What a stupid name. Even worse, now I have to go into my junior year of high school knowing absolutely no one. Wait, that's perfect, isn't it? I can completely start over. Nobody knows my name or my past. I can totally recreate myself, and nobody will know the difference. The only question is, who do I want to become? Being invisible hadn't helped before, and becoming the tough guy with Bethany over the summer had only resulted in disaster. I go through the various high school stereotypes in my head. I can act out all of them, I'm sure, but will anyone believe me? It doesn't matter. I'll pretend to be anybody, so long as I don't have to be myself. I won't get picked on again. I'm a good enough actor. I can fool anyone. I start pacing around my room. Bethany's words pop into my head. Be somebody, even if it's a lie. A smile spreads across my face. I don't have to be someone average. Someone boring that'll blend in with whatever group I manage to cling to. I'll be completely unique. That way, nobody can touch me. I look in the mirror and ruffle my blonde hair. Raspberry sweet, I think. Of course. I know exactly who I'll be. The cool guy with the weird name who doesn't give a damn about what anybody thinks. Just like Bethany said. It's a drastic measure, but I've tried everything else. I don't have any more ideas. I won't be at the bottom of the social food chain at yet another high school. Go big or go home. I bend down and start ruffling through the clothes on my floor, searching for something ridiculous. I find a bright pink shirt, sunshine yellow jeans, and a dark blue jacket with flowers on them. I nearly gag when I put them on and try not to laugh. I slip on some black and white zigzag tennis shoes that I got at a garage sale for a dollar. I nearly triple walking across the room and pick up my foot, looking at the soles. 
There are holes starting to wear on the bottom. Whatever. It's a total hipster thing to do, right? One last thing. I grab my Ray-Ban sunglasses off of my old nightstand. The ones I got with Bethany. I never go anywhere without them. I shove them over my blue eyes and beam into the mirror, shaking my head and laughing. I look completely ridiculous. And that's the plan. I can't wait to see their faces. I'll be the most flamboyant person at Limesville High. Everyone will know my name by the end of the day. I know I don't have the capability to blend in or fit in, so I'll stand out. The ancient steps creak as I head down them. This house is old. It survived three fires, two twisters, and countless storms in the 150 years it's been here. Everything's made of wood and the wallpaper's peeling off the sides. Our house is stuffed with ragged furniture from ten years ago and sculptures that Aunt Sarah likes to make on her time off. I pass a lot of things that need repairs. A leaky sink, a broken banister. Uncle Logan's still in bed. He wanted to be a teacher, but he dropped out of college and became a blue-collar worker when he couldn't afford his school loans. As for Aunt Sarah, she pulls her weight as a maid most of the time and as a waitress the rest. Her clothes are usually wrinkled and worn. But I gotta admit, despite my aunt and uncle being flat-ass broke, living with them is 100% better than living with my stuck-up rich parents. I love them. They've made a home for me here when I never had one anywhere else. I move quietly so I don't disturb my uncle. Aunt Sarah pretends to be bright and cheery in the kitchen. Even so, there are bags under her eyes. Move it, Raz, Aunt Sarah says. She's packing my lunch. I make my way around her quickly. You're going to miss your ride. Get something to eat and go. She doesn't even comment on my outfit. I think she's too tired to notice, though these colors literally punch your eyes. When I told my family I wanted to be called Raspberry instead of Mildred, everybody, except my parents, had taken to it really quickly, even though the new name is equally ridiculous. I think all of my relatives hate my given name just as much as I do. Raz is much preferable to everyone. I had never really called myself Mildred. Ever since I was a kid, I always considered myself nameless, without an identity. When my parents weren't around, my family liked to call me Fred, and I tolerated it, but that hadn't felt right either. Nothing seemed to fit until I chose my own name for myself. I conformed to Raz like a glove, and for some reason, it stuck with me. I look inside the fridge. There isn't much here. My aunt and uncle were struggling to put food on the table before they took me in, but I don't judge. I'll go hungry and stay here before I'll head back to my mom and dad's. Not like they'd take me back anyway. I sigh and grab some fruit. Aunt Sarah goes back into her bedroom to catch up on some sleep. I run back upstairs to grab my bag and stuff down breakfast. Dawn's coming up on the farm. Strange. The sun never rises this early. I look outside the window in panic. The bus is here already! I grab my bag and run out the door as I watch Mitzi board the yellow monster. I scream desperately. Hey, wait! I'm pretty fast, but our driveway is really long. It takes a good five minutes just to get down the thing. By the time that I've run halfway there, the bus is already cruising the road. I slam to a halt and watch as it slowly drives away. Damn it. <sighs> Perfect, Raz. I groan. I run my hands through my hair and try not to panic. I think about my options. There is no way I'm taking the car. Uncle Logan would freak, and if I get caught driving, the cops will probably suspend my license for the rest of human history. After all, my record isn't exactly clean. I'm not about to wake up my aunt and uncle and get a lecture on how irresponsible I am. I can't skip. The rules for me staying here include not missing school unless I'm sick. It's too far to walk, and even if I do, I'll still be late. Well, isn't this great? I mumble under my breath. Time is ticking, and I have no pleasant option. I glance at the barn. An idea forms in my head. Why didn't I think of it before? It's a crazy, stupid idea, but I want to make a great first impression, right? There's no better way to do it. I start walking toward the barn, unable to wipe the smile off my face. 
Once I reach our big red barn, I throw down my bag and yank the broken door open. Cobwebs reign supreme in the rafters, alongside the darkness and the dust. There's a lot of creepy stuff in here, like old farm equipment. It'd be perfect for the scene of a horror movie, or a great place to make out. I've never been kissed before, but I figure the barn would be the right place for a kiss, because that's what they do in all the movies. Hello, buddy! I shout to my friend, interrupting my flow of thoughts. How you doing this morning? I get a whinny in response. Buddy is a small gray horse, with a tiny head and long legs. He's technically my horse, though he belongs to everybody, because I'm the one who rides him the most. Every summer since I was little, my parents pawned me off on my aunt and uncle so they could go travel. I spent my summers growing up on the farm, helping my uncle take care of the animals and learning how to ride. It had been great, and I always hated going back home, but I could never convince my parents to let me live here until I messed up so badly they decided to throw me out permanently. This summer I didn't come to Limesville because I wanted to stay in Tin York in order to hang out with Bethany. That had been a big mistake. Buddy must think I'm here to feed him or put him out to pasture. He's in for a surprise. Our two old dairy cows are the only other animals in the barn. They make loud noises as they pass them by. Be quiet, I whisper. You're going to give me away. In the corner of the barn, there's an old farming tractor. I'm not even sure if it still runs, but you don't need a license to drive a tractor, so it's my only hope. It can move faster than I can walk, anyhow. I wonder how weird it would be to ride in on a tractor on the first day of school. But hey, I live in a hick town now, right? Do hick town things. I fire up the tractor and wince as the loud machine roars to life. Climbing aboard, I maneuver the tractor carefully out of the barn and onto the gravel driveway. I shut the barn door before I drive onto the country road, hoping my aunt and uncle don't wake up. The old tractor is backfiring, spitting out smoke and making loud creaks as it moves. It probably hasn't been used since the 1950s. I'm surprised there's still gas in it. I roll my eyes and keep it moving. Come on, you piece of crap. We're almost there. I come to my destination. Limesville. The hill I sit on top of gives me a full view of the quaint little place. Typical boring, small town. A couple shops on Main Street, a few churches, a bar, and a tiny spit of a lake. God, it's like the setting of a Hallmark movie. I like living with my aunt and uncle, but I don't like it here. I come to the Limesville High School parking lot. Every teenager outside turns and stares up at me with an open mouth, unable to believe that the new guy with the yellow pants is driving a tractor to school. I turn it off and jump down from the tractor, beaming as I lift my backpack onto my shoulders. A group catches my eye. Four kids are standing around a black Mustang nearby. One of them is definitely a meathead dressed in army camo with muscles so huge I wonder how he fits in the car. An extremely tall kid leans against the car next to him, carrying a trombone. A girl with glasses is reading out of a textbook, adjusting her glasses and blabbing on about some scientific gibberish I don't understand. I don't notice the last one until she turns to look at me. She's tiny and has these huge puppy brown eyes that suck me in the minute I see her. She's cute, really cute. I try not to blush as I give her a small smile. Oh, great, she complains. The new kid. Leave him alone, Carmen, the big guy says. If he's cool enough to ride in here on a tractor looking like that, the kid's got balls. Or he's insane, the smart girl quips, staring at me. I hesitate, unsure of what to say. I'm good at putting my foot in my mouth. I don't want them to think I'm a freak. Then I make up my mind. I'm going to be the daring one, the weird one, the one who isn't afraid to say anything or do anything, the crazy one. Don't give a damn about anybody, Bethany says in my head. I lift my sunglasses and say, hey there, I'm Raspberry Sweet. Is that your real name? Carmen says and she raises her eyebrows. Or did you just make that up? Nope, it's real, on my birth certificate and everything, I lie. And if you're going to hang with me, you've got to have just as cool of names as I do. We're definitely not hanging out with you, Carmen says, gesturing to her friends. And can you stop talking to us? People are staring. So what? 
Let them stare, I shrug. They should be staring, since you're with me. Okay, Carmen says slowly. She taps her foot on the ground. Are you done? Because this is taking up my time. Your puppy, I say, giving her the nickname instantly. I walk up to her and sling my arm around her shoulder like I've known her since grade school. I have no idea where this newfound cockiness is coming from, but I like it. And we're going to be best friends. I'm Carmen, not Puppy, she says sharply, dodging out from underneath my arm. No, I say. You're Puppy. I dare to give her a wink, and she reddens. And that's Soldier, and that's Zor, and that's Pepper. I point to the large army kid, the tall kid, and the smart girl in turn. Um, aren't you going to ask us our real names? The tall kid asks. Nope, I say happily. My names are better. You can call us whatever you like, the sassy girl says, as long as you don't talk to us. I think it's kind of cool, actually, the giant adds. Soldier is a lot better than Greg. The smart girl taps a finger against her lips and shrugs. Whatever, I like Pepper, too. Zor is weird, but if that's what you're going to call me, I don't really care, the band geek says with a bummed sigh. I turn triumphantly to Carmen. She lets out a giant groan and says, Fine, call me Puppy, Raspberry Sweet. I can't believe it. This asinine act is actually winning them over. The bell rings and the group turns to head into class. I walk with them. The hallways are filled with whispers and stares as I swagger through the halls. Can you not walk with us? We're not your friends, Puppy hisses. Of course you are, I grin. And it looks like I'm attracting a lot of attention. Hey, pretty boy, a jock cries out. Nice outfit. The group around me cringes. Inwardly, I feel sick, remembering how Cayman tormented me at Tin York. But I'll die before I let that happen again. So in true Bethany style, I stick my middle finger in the air and say, Thanks, dick. I'll let you borrow it next time. The jock's mouth drops open. I hold my head held high in the air. Nobody dares to take another crack at me. Beside me, Soldier laughs. That was great. I've never seen anyone stand up to Kevin. Now you just did, I say. I glance at Puppy and see she's trying not to laugh. The corners of her mouth are upturning. Oh, come on, I say. You know that was funny. Puppy shrugs. It was. Maybe keeping you around isn't such a bad idea after all. My attention drifts away from Puppy as someone else catches my eye. There's a girl in a really, really short skirt standing at the edge of the hallway, twirling her hair around her finger as she drools over some guy next to her locker. She's gorgeous, but definitely out of my league. Who's that? I ask. Make out Mamie, Pepper informs me. At least that's what we call her. She's been with every guy in the school. She and Puppy have hated each other since kindergarten. Really? She doesn't seem that bad, I say. My eyes are still fixed on her. Mamie gives me a quick once-over. She stares for a moment, then gives a little giggle at my outfit before she returns her attention to the dude next to her. If I ever hear you say that again, you are definitely out of the group, Puppy says violently as she glares in Mamie's direction. She looks like she wants nothing more than to pull Mamie's hair out. So I'm officially part of the group then? Great, I say. Puppy moans. As we come closer, Mamie's eyes connect with mine. The cheer from her eyes is gone. She stares at me for a second before she glances down at the floor, biting her lap. I give her an encouraging smile and nod. She doesn't see. I don't understand what's so evil about her. I suppose I'll have to learn. Then again, I don't want to get involved if she's this school's brand of Bethany. Oh, look, Soldier says with a moan. It's the warden. You mean Boss Max? Zor adds. I prefer the term Goosenator, Pepper whispers with a little snicker. And it looks like he's coming this way. Who, oh, I say, turning to all of them. Principal Max Goose, Puppy whispers to me. You're in trouble now. I look over Puppy's head to see a fat man who looks somewhat like a duck waddling toward us with a grumpy look on his face. His lips pursed like a beak. He's got a white suit on that looks like it's from the 70s. Maximum goose, I think. I'm unable to stop myself from cracking a smile. 
He stops in front of me, folding his arms. Mr. Sweet, he says. You're new to this school, I take it. Is that your tractor outside? Well, technically it's not mine, but I drove it here, I say. Any other questions, Miami Vice? Puppy smacks herself in the head. I really shouldn't be pushing it with authority since my little run-in with the law last summer. But I'm having too much fun with my persona to quit now. Without a second thought, Goose whips out some little notepad and scribbles onto it. He rips out a piece of paper and hands it to me. You can't drive tractors to school. That's detention for you. After school. No exceptions. Now get to class. I open my mouth to protest, then snap it shut. It's not worth arguing with him and getting into more trouble. He turns into his office and looks around shiftily before closing the shades. What a jerk, I say, giving me detention on my first day, and I haven't even been in class yet. You don't want to push your luck with Goose, Soldier says. You'll take any excuse to put your head on a plate, even if you are new. Yeah, he acts like he's the police, Puppy complains. He got fired from his job as a cop a few years back, so he decided to go into education instead. Which is interesting, because the company who built this school actually designs prisons. I guess he's right at home. I look at the detention slip again. This blows. The bell rings again. Everyone separates to go to their classes. I look at my schedule, feeling completely confused. Where's Art, I ask. That's my first hour. You're with me, unfortunately. Puppy sighs. Just follow me. I take my place next to Puppy in the small classroom. The teacher blabs on for a couple minutes before we start working on watercolor paintings. Bored with this already, I decide to not put in any effort and just smear paint all over my paper in random splotches. Is that really the best you can do? Puppy asks. Lighten up and have some fun, I say. I take my finger and smudge a bit of paint on her nose. I can't believe how ballsy I'm being. The shy kid from Tin York must have died over the summer. Never mind. I know he did. She glares at me and wipes it off quickly. If you don't start working a little harder, you're going to fail art. How could you possibly fail art? I ask. I wave my hand and nearly tip over her glass of water. She catches it just in time before it ruins her painting. Shit. Being the cool guy is going to be really hard with how clumsy I am. She gives me an irritated look and I say, Sorry, but really, we're in art class. It's all a matter of opinion when it comes to art, right? Not necessarily. She stabs the paper with her brush. Who says? You can't exactly prove it, I say. It's obviously apparent that in this town, nobody knows talent when they see it. I give her another wink. Talent? You? Puppy snorts. Believe me, I tell her lowly as I lean in. You haven't seen anything yet. Today, I'm definitely in my element. I've never taken acting lessons, but it doesn't matter. I have everyone fooled into thinking I'm some cocky, self-assured jerk who has the world at his fingers. Though it's not an easy task. After third period, I duck into the bathroom, already feeling exhausted. Can I really keep up with this for a whole year? Acting like this, wearing a mask, is really starting to wear on me. But I don't have a choice. This is the character I've decided to play, and I'm damn well going to see the act through. All 180 school days of it. Dude, let's go get some lunch, Soldier says, punching me playfully in the shoulder at my locker an hour later. You take forever. I'm glad to see how quickly Soldier and Zora have accepted me. Now I just have to get the girls to do the same. By the time we make it down to the lunchroom, Puppy is eating next to Pepper, who's writing a paper. Science homework? I ask, and I slide in the chair next to her. Why are you doing that so early? I want to get it done, Pepper says. Unlike some people who enjoy screwing off. She looks at Soldier teasingly. Nerd, Soldier jokes. I actually like science, Pepper says with a sideswipe at Soldier. As shown by the four different science classes you're taking this year, I say as I take a look at her schedule. When are the aliens who dropped you off going to pick you up? As soon as they take you back, Pepper says. Touché. I smile. 
I look around, realizing something's missing. You've got to be kidding me, I say. I forgot my lunch. Go buy it, Zor shrugs, chomping on a sandwich. I don't have any money, I say, slightly panicking. My cool guy persona is fading fast. Potluck, Soldier says. I don't like apples. You can have mine. And my yogurt. Pepper tosses a cup at me. And the other half of my sandwich. My mom always packs too much, Puppy complains. I don't want this water anyway, Zor says, and he rolls a bottle of water toward me. I smile at them all, trying not to reveal how touched I really am. Nobody's ever offered to share their lunch with me before. You guys are the best. Remind me to thank you someday when I'm famous. Sure, Puppy says, rolling her eyes with a laugh. Whatever you say. The bottle of water is being stubborn. I wrestle with it for a minute or two before Soldier asks. You want me to get that? No, no, I've got it, I insist, and I get to my feet. I stumble into the chair and trip over it, rolling onto the floor as the bottle of water explodes all over my pants. Half the cafeteria is laughing at me. They were attracted by the loud noise I made with the chair. But instead of running away like I would at Tin York, I get up and take a bow. They all nearly fall out of their seats with hysterics. You're popular, Zor says, and it's only your first day. I have a question. Is there ever going to be a day when you don't make a spectacle of yourself? Puppy asks. Never. I smile. My pants are soaked. Despite my little sideshow, it's going to be embarrassing walking around all day looking like I've peed myself. My yellow pants only make it worse. Puppy shakes her head, then takes off her pink jacket and tosses it to me. Wear it around your waist. It'll cover the stain. I hold it by one arm. There's a light, flowery scent to it. Puppy wears nice perfume. Unfortunately, I really don't want to smell like a girl all day. I protest the thing itself by saying, It's a girl's jacket. And... Puppy raises one eyebrow at me. I'm not stupid enough to argue with her. I wrap the jacket around my waist, and the soldier laughs at me. To make him laugh harder, I pretend to strike a pose. Oh, sit down, you, Pepper says, and she yanks me into my chair. Besides, it's only water. So what do you do for fun? Soldier asks me, leaning back in his chair and putting his feet up on the table. I play paintball. Zor's in the school bin, and Pepper's part of the science club. Puppy's just grumpy all the time. I do other things, Puppy protests, and I told you to call me Carmen, not Puppy. Soldier smiles. Too late? It's sticking now. My point is, we all have a thing. What's yours? I hesitate. I try to think of something cool, something I'm good at. But there's only one thing on earth that I can actually do, so I grin and try to push down my nerves as I say, I'm an actor. That makes a lot of sense, actually, Zor notes. I think I've blown my cover, but Pepper nods and says, Yeah, you look like a theater kid. Kind of behave like one, too, in an obnoxious way. I sigh in relief. I spend the rest of the hour stuffing down the food they gave me and avoiding questions. The bell rings, and we walk to our lockers. People are giggling at me because of the jacket. I suck it up, pretending to flounce it like a skirt. This only makes the crowd laugh harder, and I grin. A good actor always needs an audience. I could be a comedian. You're good at making people laugh. You're gonna be famous one day, Soldier says, clapping me on the back. And when you are, make sure you mention me when you get an Oscar. Sure, I chuckle nervously. But right now, I'm kind of doing my own thing. I'm obsessed with movies. One day, I'd really like to make my own. Yeah, right. Puppy rolls her eyes. The day that happens, you can call me. I'll be your lead role. After lunch, I head to my next class, which is study hall. What do we do in study hall? I ask Zor. I didn't even know schools did that anymore. This school has a shortage of teachers, Zor explains. Every hour the classes are packed so full that the teachers can't handle it. It probably isn't even legal to have that many students in one confined space, so the hour after lunch is the worst. With nearly 40 kids to a classroom and three teachers going over to the middle school to teach in the afternoon, there's about 30 kids left over with no classes, mostly juniors and seniors, which leaves all of us with nowhere to go. 
Soldier, Puppy, Zor, Pepper, and I are all in study hall together. I wonder if Puppy is getting annoyed with me yet. She has me in almost every class. We come to a small, abandoned classroom at the very end of the school. Inside are a bunch of mismatched desks and chairs. Mamie's drawing on an old chalkboard. A bunch of kids are playing baseball with binders and wadded up scraps of paper that are covered in spit, which is so lovely. I immediately realize there's no such thing as studying in study hall. Throughout the class, kids are constantly going in and out. People from other classes like to skip and join the party. Let's at least try to get some work done today, okay, guys? Pepper asks. Yeah, right. Well, like that's going to happen, I say. I lean back on my chair and yawn, thinking about taking a nap. I'm going to the band room to see if I can practice, Zor says, and he grabs his stuff. Anybody want to come along? No, thanks. Puppy shakes her head. Have fun, I say as he goes out the door. I let out a deep breath and become a spectator in paper wad baseball. I'd consider joining in, but I'd better not. I know how I am with sports. I'd swing the binder too hard and end up breaking a window. If one of those paper balls hits me in the head, somebody is going down, Puppy growls. It isn't two seconds after she says that when an abnormally large paper wad hits her right in the face. It sticks to her hair for a few seconds before it slowly slides off her head. The classroom noise falls to a dull murmur. I catch on to something. Puppy isn't popular, but everyone knows not to mess with her. She gets to her feet. Who threw that? She asks, looking at the jocks menacingly. I could swear that if she had the ability, she'd be foaming at the mouth. Some kid points his finger at his friend and says, It was Bobby. Bobby noticeably blanches as Puppy steps forward and says, Well, jerk face, why don't you watch where you're aiming? She throws the wad as fast as she can at him. It's a good throw, one that I know the boys aren't going to be able to catch. It almost hits Bobby in the face before Mamie reaches out her hand and snatches the thing out of thin air. Wow! Somebody shouts across the room. Good catch, Mamie! Both girls ignore him. I can sense a fight coming on. I have no idea what history is between these two ladies, but obviously it can't be anything good. Mamie tosses the paper ball to the ground. Let it go, Carmen. You're so uptight. It was an honest mistake. If it was silent before, it's dead quiet now. The tension's so thick between them that somebody could run naked across the room and nobody would notice. Puppy takes a step forward before Soldier barges in. It's not worth it, he whispers in her ear. Mamie glances at me. You know what, Carmen? Maybe you will loosen up, since you've got a new friend. I've heard he's got connections to Bethany Cade. The entire classroom gasps, and my stomach drops to the floor. How does she know? Did word travel that far? Bethany's reputation precedes her, but I didn't think the kids in Limesville would know about her too. Guess that's a miscalculation. My new friends turn to me in shock. I quickly rearrange my face and say, Yeah, I know her. So what? So what? It was all over the news. I heard you stole a car. Mamie accuses before her eyes brighten. Tell us the real story. The classroom is silent. I open my mouth, wondering if I should make up some story or tell them the truth. Puppy subs in for me. That's none of your business, is it, Mamie? It is when we could be going to school with a criminal, she replies. Don't you want to know if the new guy has had trouble with the police? It's probably just a nasty rumor, Puppy snaps. When you made up, as usual. Mamie gives her a loathing look, then turns away and returns to drawing on the chalkboard. Puppy won this one, but only because she doesn't know the truth. The class is disappointed. They all wanted to find out dirt on me, the new kid. Everyone goes back to what they were doing, and Puppy sits back down. I move my chair closer to her and say, Thanks for defending me. Puppy grits her teeth. Bethany Cade? Did you really know her? Kind of, I lie. But all of that stuff you heard on the news about her, I wasn't involved. I transferred here from uh, an arts academy in New York. I have to make shit up quickly. I was studying acting, but my parents wanted me to have a normal high school experience, so they forced me to come here. 
So you've never been to Tin York? Pepper asks. That's where I heard Bethany was from. I shake my head, a blank expression on my face. Puppy relaxes and says, Sorry, Mamie makes up stories for attention. I'm sure you weren't involved in anything that Bethany got tied up in. Of course he wasn't, Soldier exclaims. Does he look like the type of guy who'd hang around with someone like Bethany? She was one of my cousin's friends. I met her once or twice, but we barely talked. I say, inventing wildly. That's it. Sorry if you think I stole a car. I laugh a little louder than I mean to, but play it cool. It's whatever, Puppy says. She's actually smiling at me. I trust you. I feel really, really bad. She shouldn't trust me. But I'm too ashamed to tell her the truth. Chapter 2 I don't let myself relax until the high school is out of sight. Once it's far behind me, I sigh, letting the mask slip off my face. I enjoy the autumn breeze as I ride back home on the tractor. One down. 179 more school days to go. 179 more days of faking my identity and hiding my past. Should be easy enough. Mitzi's already at the barn, grinning at me like the Cheshire Cat as I put the tractor back inside. You're going to be in trouble, she sings. Get out of here, little bug, before I squish you, I snap. She sticks her tongue out at me and runs away while I brace myself for what's waiting in the house. Slowly, I leave the barn and go inside. Uncle Logan is sitting in a chair, and he does not look happy. When people see us together, they assume we're father and son. We have the same blonde hair, same blue eyes. He's bulkier, though, and I'm just a twig. I respect him a lot, partly because he's fair, partly because he took my side with the whole Bethany incident, and partly because when he was my age, he put a dent in a locker with my dad's head. I wonder if he's going to put a dent in my head. I put my bag on the counter. Decide to go on a little tractor ride this morning? He asks. I nod. I'm not brave enough to say anything. Raz, what have you been thinking lately? Uncle Logan asks. His face bunches up into a bunch of furious little lines. What was I supposed to do? If I miss the first day of school, my probation officer is going to want to know why, I protest. You could have gotten me. Yeah, like I was going to wake you up. You and Aunt Sarah are sleep-deprived enough. Sarah is going to roast you on a pike when she gets home. Once she saw the tractor was gone, she was absolutely livid. The phone is ringing. At the sound of the loud bell, Uncle Logan's face turns into a grimace. Bill collectors call this place more than teenagers, with no cell phone restrictions. Want me to get that? I offer. If it's the electric company again, tell them I've died. Uncle Logan says tiredly. I pick it up and ask, Hello? I take a glass down from the cabinet and fill it with water, then take a drink. Is this the sweet residence? At the sound of that droning, dull voice, I spit out the sip of water I took into the sink. It's maximum goose. I was in such a good mood when I left that I'd completely forgotten about the detention I was supposed to serve after school. Shit. Uh, yeah, I say. At the sound of my tone, Uncle Logan grows suspicious. He holds out his hand for me to give him the phone. I do so, hightailing it out of there and up the stairs. I don't get to my room before I hear Uncle Logan yell, Raz, get down here! I drag my feet as I force myself back into the kitchen. Uncle Logan is already off the phone. Did you skip detention today? I shuffle my feet and look around the room. My ADHD gets even worse when I'm in trouble. It was an accident. Damn it, Raz! Uncle Logan slams his hand down on the counter, and I jump at the noise. Do you want to get into more trouble? Let me remind you that it was only because of your previously clean record that the judge let you off! Don't remind me, I scowl. Let me also mention that paying your ridiculous fine put us several months behind on the bills, since your father refused to, he grumbles. I mean, I, I can pay you back, I offer weakly. I suppose you want to end up like Bethany. You're idle, he growls. I ball my hands into fists. She is not my idol. You're sure acting a lot like her, 
Uncle Logan yells. Raz, stop fidgeting! I halt my body from its shaking. It takes all my effort. I didn't even realize I was doing it. Uncle Logan shakes his head and says, Raz, I'm really disappointed in you and concerned. I thought we talked about this. We did, I think. I just never told you the whole story. His face slackens into worry. Raz, is something bothering you? Is it something I should know about? He's peering at me like he knows. It's terrifying. I shake my head slowly and try to put on a face of utmost confusion. It fools him, thank God. My uncle sighs. He points to me and says, You're going to serve that detention next week, and you're also going to serve the two extra ones the principal piled on for you running away. I also suggest you write an apology letter. No. Defeated, I clomp up to my room. I'm good at writing apologies. I have one that's absolutely dripping with poisoned sweetness in under five minutes. If there's anything my parents taught me, it's how to be passive-aggressive. The hard part is going to be delivering that apology to Goose. I fall onto my bed and look at the various movie posters coating the walls. I need to be more careful. I'll do anything so long as I don't have to go back to my parents' house. It had been a great day, and now, all well, because of Maximum Goose, it's ruined. I turn over onto my side. Bethany, my idol. What a ridiculous idea. I haven't wanted to be like Bethany in a long time. Now that I don't have to pretend, everything starts to fall in around me. I yank the blanket over my head and try to close my eyes. All I can see is Cayman's snarling, disgusting face, and I feel like screaming. Don't think about it. I have to keep myself together. This is my new life now. The past doesn't matter. The best thing I can do for myself is act like it never happened, I think. I have to do my best to become Raspberry Sweet and forget about it all. Aunt Sarah grounded me for taking off with the tractor and skipping detention. In her exact words, it was something like, If I find out you've disobeyed me in any way or have done something stupid again, your skin will be hanging on my wall before the weekend. In study hall the next day, everyone takes notice of my pouting. Zora got kicked out of the band room and is being almost as grumpy as I am. It looks like we're having a sulking contest. Oh, stop being such a drama queen, Puppy says. So you got grounded because you forgot you had detention. So what? It's not just that, I mumble. Oh, really? Soldier asks, smiling. Yes, I snap. I've only been here two days and I've already gotten into trouble. We told you not to mess with the Goosenator, Pepper says as she chews on the end of her pencil. You getting grounded was your own fault. Okay, I say, ignoring her. Whatever. I can tell that everyone in this class is extremely bored. Having ultimate freedom in school has already gotten dull. Mamie is scraping the chalk against the board, drawing lines in no particular direction. Soldier is taking a nap against his desk, and Zor is humming a tune from band practice. Pepper's bent over her homework as usual, and Puppy is looking at me with a disgusted look on her face, which I've come to find is normal. Everybody else is chatting nonsense. I gaze up at the ceiling and tap my fingers against the desk in irritation. There has to be a way to make this class less boring, and to distract everyone from the rumors that have to be circulating the school about me. My persona can only do so much. I need something to make me stand out and cover for whatever history someone digs up. The only thing that can make me stand out is my acting, and I can't do anything with that unless... Unless... I grab Puppy's hand and pull her up from the chair. Hey, what's the big idea? She yelps. You, my friend, are going to be my lead role. I smile. Excuse me? She asks, totally confused. You said that if I ever made a movie that you would be the lead. Congratulations. We're going to make a movie. What? When did this crazy idea pop into your head? Puppy asks. Just now, I beam. It's brilliant. We'll make a script and practice the parts, then put it all together on film and show it. To who? Soldier raises his head off the desk and looks at me sleepily. To everyone! I shout. 
Count me out, Puppy says. I'm not doing anything, and there is no way I'm acting. I give her a hurt look. Puppy, you promised! When? Yesterday! You told me if I ever made a movie, you'd be my lead! Congratulations! You got the part! I throw my hands up. She bares her teeth, but I know she won't go back on her word to me, even if it was a joke. She's not the type of person who likes being known as a liar. Soldier beams. Can I be the super evil baddie with the big guns? Giant guns, I promise. And Zor, half of any movie is the music. You could compose and organize it. The offer to create music already has Zor sucked in. The only one I need to convince is Pepper. I turn to her and ask, Come on, Pepper. You know you want to. Just go with it. She gives me a look, like a crocodile who is eyeing the poor, tiny animal that it wants to eat. The only way I'm taking part is if you let me be the director. You're going to need someone to run everything smoothly, and you can't do that, Raz. Let me be your visionary. I hesitate. I kind of want to be the director, but that would be unfair if I'm going to be acting in the movie, too. Fine, you can be director. Um, I hate to break this to you, Raz, Soldier says. But if you're going to put on a movie, you're going to need people. A lot of people. Not necessarily, I protest. We can make it a small production. Do you want it to be a real movie or a smaller film with only a few actors? Zor says. He's finally stopped humming. If you want to make a full movie, you need a cast, Pepper states. We can't do all the work by ourselves. I look around the room. Since we're going to be mostly filming at this hour... I decide to take a chance. I stand up on my desk and wave my arm around. Hey, everybody! I say. The room goes quiet, and for the first time, I'm glad I have such a big mouth. Listen up! Me and my friends are going to make a movie! Is there anyone in here who wants to help out? I can see the looks on their faces already. They want to make fun of me. A movie? One of the jocks says. What are you talking about? I shrug. You know, get a camera, make a script, and film it. We're making it in this class, since there's nothing else to do. All in one hour? Some girl in the back asks. No, I say, my patience waning. I don't even want to work with these people. But what choice do I have? I have to rein them in, in order to get them to like me. We'll work on it until it's done, I guess. Who will supervise? Another girl asks. Or teach? Mamie has her arms crossed. I can tell she thinks this is a dumb idea. Nobody, I say. We'll teach ourselves. We'll just do it our way, how we want. So far, we have three actors and a director. Does anybody else want to join? The room is quiet. Maybe my idea is stupid. Everybody is too scared to volunteer for anything. Then, amazingly, some kid with glasses raises his hand. I point at him, and he says... I can put it all together on the computer and do some special effects if you want. I need to practice with CGI for my college application. That'd be cool, I say in relief. Finally, some outside help. What's this storyline? A girl in the back asks. I think her name is Ola. We don't have one yet, I shrug. We haven't got a script. I can do that, Ola says. She grabs a boy next to her. Me and my friend Perry can write it. Anything you guys want us to put in? It has to have a villain with huge guns, Soldier says. He's getting annoying with the gun thing. A war scene! A jock named Don shouts, and I'm surprised he's getting into it. Romance ending in tragedy, Mamie says with a daydreamy look. Don't forget zombies, the kid with glasses says. Everyone looks at him. He shrugs and says, What? Zombies are cool. So are we good? I ask. A romantic tragedy with a villain who has big guns. Controlling the zombies? Pepper finishes. I nod. This is certainly not a genre-specific movie, but I don't really give a damn. Just so long as we can do this together. I turn to Jocks, hanging in the corner, and ask, Are you in? The rest of them shrug. Better than being bored around here all day. Some guy I'm sure is called Freddy Sass. What do we do when we're done with it? Ola asks. We should probably put it online, and make copies for ourselves. Maybe if we're good enough, we can send it into a film contest, or even put on a showing in town, I suggest. To sweeten the deal, I say, 
We might get some scholarship money for it. Colleges will find it impressive. The room is buzzing with excitement now. Perry stands up and says, Ola will come over to my house tonight and we'll work on the script. Anybody have a camera? I do, Don says. I could bring it on Monday. Great, I say. Anybody else want to join in? Mamie sighs. I suppose I could help you create the set and be the makeup artist. You're not putting anything on my face, Puppy mumbles under her breath. There's a group over in the corner who looks pretty shy. One of the boys there says, We'll be your film crew and some of us can act. The rest of us can help Wizard. They point to the guy with the glasses. The number of suggestions grow. By the time we're done, we have a full cast of actors, a film crew, a set crew, and a special effects team. Over half the class is taking part. Almost everyone is upset when the bell rings. I head to my next class, but I can't concentrate for the rest of the day because of the nervous feeling in my stomach. Plans and ideas for the movie are running through my head like wildfire. But is this really going to work? I'm not sure, but if it doesn't, it could blow my cover. So I decide that it has to. For once, I want the weekend to go by quickly. School started on a Thursday this year, giving us only two days of class before Saturday. Uncle Logan and Aunt Sarah notice my excitement about returning to school and are pretty confused about it. Mitzi asks if I'm sick. I try to think about the movie as much as possible, because whenever I don't, I think of Cayman. Several times over the weekend, I throw up. I need this movie to work out. Cayman has ceased haunting my dreams alone and is now hanging around with me during the daytime. If I don't distract myself by making this film, I'll go mad. I need something to put all this anxiety and pain and bullshit into. But by the time Monday rolls around, I'm worried. What if everyone's forgotten about the movie? What if, even worse, they all realize what a dumb idea it really is? My fears are cast aside, however, when I find the same group of people hanging around my desk at fourth hour. Hey, Russ, are we going to start today? I've got the camera. Don holds it up. I can't believe my eyes. Ola and Perry have half a script in their hands already. We worked on it all weekend. It's only a rough draft, but we figure we can work out the kinks as we go along, Ola says. As we go along, don't we have to do it, like, step by step? Freddy asks. You don't film scenes in order, I tell him. You have to work around actor schedules. In our case, it's the scriptwriter schedules. Well, let's start, Don says. What's the first finished scene that you guys came up with? Ola ruffles through the pages. It's a scene where the main character, that's you, Carmen, is trapped in the zombie fortress. Her friend, that's you, Raz, breaks in to get her out. How do I do that? I ask, looking over her shoulder. We figured that we could put her in the janitor's closet all tied up, and you come through the door to get her out. Once you unbind her, you escape through the door and go out into the courtyard, where you do battle with the zombies, Perry says. Who are? Don asks. You, Zor, and Soldier as their villainous leader, Perry says. How are we going to make it look real? Pepper asks. Perry shakes his head. We didn't figure that part out yet. You're the director. Pepper cocks her head. I suppose we could do some special effects. She glances at Wizard. Leave it to me, he says, nodding. I'll make it look real. All right, let's go, I say. I'm eager to rehearse. Here's your script. Ola pulls out a binder from her bag. And here's puppies. The other three should study their lines while you all are in the janitor's closet. Everybody else can brainstorm. Ooh, puppy and Raz in the closet together, Zor says teasingly. Puppy hits him on the shoulder and says, Shut up. We find some rope in the closet across the hall, and Soldier adds a nice effect by stuffing a torn piece of fabric in Puppy's mouth. The look on her face is half funny, half terrifying. I wonder if she'll eat me alive when I unbind her. Alright, Raz, go behind those shelves, Pepper points. If you come out at just the right angle, Wizard can make it look like you're phasing through the wall. Gotcha, I smile. I go behind the shelves. Brody, our cameraman, says, Rolling. I jog out from behind the shelves. Stop, stop, stop! Pepper jumps up and pushes me back. You look like you're skipping through strawberry fields, not participating in a rescue mission. What? No, I'm not! 
I'm in a hurry, I protest. You've broken through an infiltration of zombies. You're not going to come skipping out of there with flowers in your pants, Pepper says. Now do it over. Sighing, I try again. Pepper is ridiculously bossy and picky. After the third time, I finally get it right, by Pepper's standards. I go over and yank off Puppy's gag. She yells, Ouch! That hurt! Cut! Pepper shakes her head. This is getting nowhere. I look at the rag in my hand and say, Maybe it would be better if I left it in. I stuff it back in Puppy's mouth. She gets up, chasing me around the room with her hands tied behind her back. She's screaming behind the fabric, and when she spits it out, she yells, Get back over here, Raz! Hey, watch the camera! Brody yells as we nearly send it, and him flying. Puppy lunges a kick at me, and it connects. I trip and fall into the shelves of supplies. It all comes crashing down onto the floor in a giant heap. Great, Puppy grumbles. I knew this was a bad idea. Nice going, Raz. Hey, you kicked me, I protest. We start bickering until Pepper comes between us and says, You two have to clean this up. We can't start over until it's done. I'm not helping him when he made the mess. Puppy wriggles out of her binds. Yes, you are, if you don't want to get in trouble. Now come on. The three of us start lifting up the shelves and putting things back where they belong. Brody, mysteriously, is nowhere to be found. By the time the cleaning is done, the bell rings. Pepper gives us an aggravated look and says, Tomorrow we're starting over. Learn your lines. She grabs her bag and heads out of there. Puppy and I are left standing alone. Puppy is still glaring at me. I raise my arms and say, Hey, I'm not the one who decided to trip her rescuer. Her glare changes into a smile. Then she breaks into a laugh, shaking her head. That was actually kind of fun. Really? I ask. Yeah. She beams at me. Honestly, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I can't wait until tomorrow. When we clamber out of the janitor's closet together, she's still smiling. I feel victorious. I'm finally getting through to her. It takes three days to get the escape scene right. By the time we finish it, everybody but us knows our lines for the next take, and we have to memorize them in a hurry. We decide to film the next section at Soldier's house after school. Puppy and Soldier are the only actors needed for the take, and Brody's there for the camera. But I'm tagging along, just to see if Pepper can squeeze me in somewhere. Soldier lives in a pretty big house in the suburbs, but his backyard is tiny compared to what we have on the farm. I can smell something cooking from a grill outside. Over here, guys, Soldier says, and he waves his hand. He's barbecuing burgers on his dad's grill for dinner. You want to eat before or after we start? Let's practice first. Pepper suggests, and she nods to Brody. That way, after we eat, we can start filming. Fine by me, Puppy says. Everybody is already in their assigned costumes, mostly leather and jeans to fit the zombie apocalypse theme. Soldier, for extra effect, is carrying a menacing yet fake sword that we borrowed from Wizard, because Wizard is the only guy geeky enough to have something like that. Besides me, and I'm not going to let anybody know I have one. Soldier gestures to me and says, Watch the grill while we're filming, okay? I nod. Pepper's already barking orders. Now remember, Pepper says, this is an intense intimidation scene. Soldier, you're going to need to be really demanding and ready to attack. Puppy, you need to be resistant, unforgiving. Ready, set, action! Lyles! Puppy roars. I've come back for you! I stand back, impressed. For as much resistance that Puppy gave me for being in this movie, she's actually really good. A natural actress, I'd say. Soldier turns, amusement on his face. Ah, young Theophania, I was hoping that you would return. I have a favor to ask of you. I hold back a small laugh. Soldier's a really bad actor, but it doesn't really matter. We're only doing this movie for fun, and me for practice. Even so, I can't stop watching. Don't tempt me. Where's the weapon? Puppy hisses. As the scene goes on, Puppy's dialogue draws me in. I can practically smell the charred zombie flesh, see the small black smoke of the battlefield puffing through the air. It's almost as if something's burning. Do as I say, 
Soldier pokes Puppy squarely in the chest. Or else all of your race will be demolished! I'm not giving in to any of your demands! Puppy shouts, standing up to him. They're so different in height, the shot is nearly comical. Puppy opens her mouth to say her next line, but instead of, Now perish, you zombie freak! It comes out as, Holy crap, the grill's on fire! I turn around and realize the burgers have erupted into three-foot-high flames. I jump back with my hands in front of my face, and Soldier runs to get the hose. No, wait! Stop! I say, but it's too late. Soldier starts squirting the water out of the hose like a mad fireman. The jet of water hits me, mostly in the face, and knocks me over. I'm dripping, and so is the grill when he's done. Fire's out, Soldier says with a smile. I wring out my shirt with a sour expression, totally soaked. It doesn't help when Brody zooms in on the camera and says, Excellent, I'm really getting a great take here. Brody, I swear you're having a love affair with the camera. Now please get it out of my face, I snap. Great, Raz, Pepper growls. Now we have nothing to eat. No biggie, I can go inside and make more on the stove, Soldier shrugs. No, Pepper says, and she pulls me up. Raz here can walk his butt uptown and get us something, since it's his fault he almost caught your damn yard on fire. Puppy is giggling. She puts her hand over her mouth to muffle the sound. She thinks I'm funny. Pepper is glaring at me, but I really don't care. I'd do it again, as long as it made Puppy laugh. Chapter 3 on my first day of detention, I enter an empty classroom after school and take a seat. Goose holds the door open, looking like he wants nothing more than for me to evaporate on the spot. I swear, why do people who hate kids decide they want to be teachers? When I see Mamie's here, too, I try not to act surprised. I take a desk three spots away from her and wait, but it's obvious that there are no more kids coming. Goose must have picked this little timeout special just for us. Half an hour. Goose points at the clock. I have an important call to make. I'll be back. Goose goes out the door, and I swear he locks it. I stare at the back of Mamie's head, dread filling up my stomach. Is this his strategy? Locking Mamie and I in one room and seeing who will come out alive? She and I have our differences, sure, but we aren't about to claw at each other. Now if Puppy were in my place instead. If this is detention, it's not that bad. Nothing like spending time in a cell. Five minutes pass in silence. Mamie chews on her nails, and I stare at the walls. The unbearable quiet is about to make me crack. I'm forced to say something to stop the ringing in my ears. So, what are you in for? I ask, wondering if she'll answer. Mamie turns in her seat. Too many counts of PDA? Apparently, French kissing in the halls is a crime. She rolls her eyes. You? I ran away from Goose. I smirk. On accident, but I still did it. I guess that was the second offense. The first one was when I called him Miami Vice. Nice. She cackles. You know, it's a really cool idea, you coming up with the movie thing. People are actually excited about it. I've never seen our grade so unified. Word has gotten around. Some people think you're pretty dumb. Thanks, I say sourly. But not me, she says quickly. I mean, I love it. It's actually a blast. Do you really want to show it to an audience? I don't know, I say slowly. It would be nice, but we'd have to find a place to play it. If we can't do that, we should just send it into a contest or something. Yeah, she agrees. That would be really cool. She moves closer to me and says, I have a question. Will you tell me what happened over the summer with Bethany Cade? I mean, what really happened? All I hear are rumors, and I'd like to hear your side of the story. My good mood vanishes. This is Goose's strategy. To lock me up with Mamie, because he knows she'll question the snot out of me until I give her every last detail or drop dead from the interrogation. He really is out to get me. Nothing happened, I say coolly. I was telling the truth. No, you aren't, she replies. My bullshit meter is flawless, Raz. I can tell when people are lying, because I've done it enough myself. Her voice becomes sincere. I promise I won't tell anyone. 
I freeze. Out of everyone here, Mamie is the one person in the school who can see right through me. Probably because she knows what it's like to put up an act herself. I don't know, I say cautiously. I don't really want to tell anyone. Bet you told her, Mamie pouts. I know she means puppy. No, she doesn't know anything. So why won't you tell me then? Mamie asks. Why should I tell you? I ask. You insulted me about it in front of the whole class. I didn't, she says quickly. I was just saying that to piss your friend off. I'll do anything to get under Carmen's skin. That's not going to get on my good side, I protest. What exactly happened between you two anyway? I kissed some boy she liked in kindergarten, she says, waving her hand. She still hasn't let it go. We've been doing shitty stuff to each other every year since. You're a gossip queen, from what I've heard, I say. If I tell you anything, you'll go spreading it to the entire school. I just want to know what happened, she says, slower this time. I don't believe half of what people are saying about you, and I want to know the truth. I'm not the kind of girl who judges somebody before she gets to know them. You can't be the person everyone is saying you are. I keep quiet. She sees the wary look on my face and says, Don't worry. I won't tell anyone. I'm a better secret keeper than most people think. I cock my head. She leans onto my desk and asks, So how did you and Bethany even meet? I know she's not your cousin's friend. You made that up. I wonder if I can trust her. Make out Mamie, head of the gossip grapevine. Puppy won't be happy if I tell her. She'll be pissed if she finds out that I even talked to her. But does Puppy have to know? There's a nagging voice in the back of my head telling me to shut up, but at the same time, I really want to let my guard down and take the mask off. I just want to tell one person what happened, and get it off my chest. She's leaning forward with the utmost sincerity. As far as I can tell, she's not lying about wanting to take my side. I take a deep breath. Alright, since you've got nothing better to do in here, I might as well. But you'd better not tell anyone. Your secrets are safe with me, she says. Trust me. Okay, well, I am trusting you. We lock eyes. Pay attention, because I'm only going to tell the story once. Tin York Park is boring as ever. Little kids play on brand new equipment that the town hall just installed. Equipment that moves too slow and never creaks. The old equipment that I had played on for years is gone, burned, or missing in the woods. It's really too bad. Memories just thrown away. I lean against a bench and sigh. There's nothing to do here. Tin York is so boring. Thoughts whirl around my head. Thoughts of moving away. What are the chances I make it out to California after I graduate? Forget college. I know where I want to be. Hollywood. I just don't know how to get there. What are you so quiet about? Bethany asks. She's hanging upside down from some monkey bars. I don't know. I kick a rock. Just thinking about the day when I'm finally going to get out of here. Ha! <laughs> I think about that like every second. She flips down from the monkey bars and starts walking toward a crowd of houses. Where are you going? I call. To play Ding Dong Ditch, she says. What? Are you crazy? I ask. You're a prankster? That's a light way of putting it, she murmurs. She pushes me down into a bush and says, Stay here and watch. It's the start of summer, and I haven't hung out with Bethany much. I don't know her well, but I know that she likes to cause trouble. She creeps up to a house, then runs up and presses the doorbell. Within seconds, she's away from the door and at my side again. We both have to suppress our laughter as we see an old man come to the door, shaking his fist. You damn kids! Always ringing my doorbell! I'm tired of your dubstep Disney Channel shit! He screams some more nonsense before he hobbles inside and shakes his head. That was funny. Do it again, I demand. I watch house after house as Bethany rings almost every doorbell, never getting caught. I take note of how she does it, the way she moves like a ghost from door to door. Now you try, she says, poking me in the arm. Me? I say. I don't like to mess with stuff like that. It's sort of rude. But it's funny, right? Just once, she insists. 
There's a large brick house across the street. What about there? I ask. She nods eagerly. I snicker as I sneak to the house, but I'm nowhere as good as Bethany. I'm making a lot of noise. She nearly gives me away when I fall over a garden gnome because her laugh is so loud. But I manage to make it to the front door and waste no time ringing it. I run back to the bushes with Bethany and wait. Another old man comes to the front door. I nearly bust a gut. He's wearing a short red bathroom that barely covers his knees, fuzzy slippers, and a towel wrapped around his head. Confused, he goes back inside as Bethany and I chuckle. He left the door unlocked, I say. Bethany has a wicked look in her eyes. Come on. She grabs my hand and starts pulling me toward the house. I don't understand what we're doing until she opens the door. What? Bethany, no! I say and I pull my hand away. Just go! She shoves me inside before she shuts the door behind us. It's the kind of house that has classical music playing, with marble floors and expensive paintings lining the walls. Bethany beckons for me to follow. I tiptoe after her, feeling like this is a bad idea. Bethany walks up to a dresser. Several diamond rings are glistening back at us. Oh, shiny. She grabs the biggest one and pockets it. Bethany, that's not ours! Put it back! I hiss. You think these rich assholes are going to miss it? Please. She rolls her eyes and pockets another diamond ring. Hey! A sharp voice snaps. We turn to see the old man standing in the doorway. Get out of my house! The old man starts for us. Though he looks so stupid with a tiny robe and all, he also looks menacing. Bethany pulls me around and we escape through the open side window just before the old man grabs the back of my shirt. We don't stop running until we reach the playground again. We collapse in the grass, laughing. You're alright, kid, she chuckles. For a raspberry, anyway. My laughter slows. We have to return those rings, you know. I know it was a joke that you stole them, but we can't keep them. Sure, Bethany says. She gets to her feet and helps me up. Yeah, we will. Tomorrow. At the end of the week, Bethany has both diamond rings on. One for each hand. I don't say anything because I don't want to make her mad. Besides, it was like she said. It wasn't like those people would even notice they were gone. Hold on a minute, Mamie says. I'm cut off as I take another breath. Do you mean to say you and Bethany stole two diamond rings? I didn't take them. She did. I just didn't stop her, I say. Mamie and I both shut up as we see a shadow outside the door. Goose comes in and story time is cut short. He looks at me and I look at him. An invisible passage, a mutual dislike passes between us. I've only been here for a week at Limesville High, but already I don't like him. Time's up, he says. Meet me back in this room same time next Wednesday. Mamie and I gather our things. She grabs my arm and says, Next week. Will you tell me the rest? I don't know if we'll have enough time, I say. It's still a long story, and I've only just started. Please, she begs. I can't resist those eyes. They remind me of puppies. Sure, whatever. I'll try, at least. Mamie nods. You can be sure I won't tell. I'm not exactly a saint, but I do keep secrets. Before I can ask what she means, she's out the door and gone. Chapter 4 At the end of the month, there's a football game at the school's home field. We decide that just outside the field is the perfect place to hold our next scene, a complicated argument between my character and puppies. We bump into several couples kissing under the rafters, including Mamie. She gives me a half-hearted wave. Puppy snorts and tosses her ponytail behind her head. This time, it's just us, Zor, and Pepper filming. Our team, the Limesville Lemons. Yes, I know, Limesville Lemons. I nearly cried when I found out our mascot name is losing. Our school couldn't be less enthusiastic about the team if you shut them in a morgue. The team's record is more pathetic than Tin York's, and that's saying something. Even so, there are a lot of people here. It's a few games before playoffs, so I guess we should have expected it. We have to be careful that no one gets caught on film by accident. 
Principal Max Goose is chatting with somebody at the corner of the field. I'm surprised he's even here. I heard he usually doesn't come to games. Goose narrows his eyes as I pass by, but he looks too busy to harass me right now. I'm glad. I'm not exactly sure if we're allowed to film here, and I know that if I ask, Goose will say no regardless of what the rules say. Let's move over here, guys, Puppy says, pointing to a section of unoccupied sidewalk. No one will bother us. Pepper takes her spot as director. Okay, guys, you ready? We rehearsed it all study hour today. We're ready, I say. Yeah, whatever. Get it over with. Puppy rolls her eyes. Zora positions the camera. Three, two, one, rolling. I turn toward Puppy as the scene begins. Suddenly, I become my character. Passionate, worried, concerned about my friend in danger. It feels so good to slip out of Raspberry Sweet, to slip out of my own life and become someone else. Theophania, you have to love me. Take my hand and I'm sure we can beat all the zombies. It'll just be you and me forever. I hold out my hand, trying not to feel annoyed with Perry and Ola. They made all of my lines so overdramatic and cheesy. I have to overact just to compensate. Puppy blinks a few times. I don't know. It's all so sudden. I raise my hand to stroke her cheek. When I touch her skin, my hand tingles, and I'm trying hard not to smile. Things are going so well just before Pepper yells, Cut! We turn to her. That was okay, Pepper whines. But I'm not getting enough emotion from Puppy. Come on, this is your character's long-lost lover, offering to run away in the middle of a war. Get it together! Why don't I just push him down and start going at it right now, then? Puppy asks, and she crosses her arms. Zora bends over, laughing. I blush. If you'd like to do that, fine. It'll give the film more emotion, Pepper says with a shrug. Zora laughs harder. I try hard not to look at Puppy. Why do we have to do this stupid, gushy love story? Puppy moans. Because Mamie asked for it, and we're trying to involve everybody. It's a class effort, Pepper protests. One more time. Puppy taps her fingers against her arms and sighs, then turns back to me. I get ready to say my lines, but everything I've memorized falls out of my head as I stare into those puppy brown eyes. In moments, I'm completely lost in them. God, she's beautiful. I wonder what she'd do if I just leaned down and... Out of my way! A voice screams in my ear. Before I know who said that, some kid jars us both apart. We stare in amazement as a dude from the soccer team runs past us, completely nude, sprinting onto the field. He's obviously very drunk and is screaming his head off. Oh my gosh, Pepper whispers. Goose is going to lay an egg when he sees him. If they catch him, I say, feeling amused. I always thought streaking was something people talked about but never actually had the guts to do. I'm beginning to like Limesville. We watch as the student is chased around the field by players, referees, and teachers. Nobody wants to touch him. Some football player throws him a towel, and the drunk student is carted off the field by none other than Maximum Goose. The only sound we can hear is the laughter of the crowd. I turn around to face my friends, who are red-faced with both embarrassment and laughter. Please tell me you didn't get that, I ask Sor. He gives me a weirded out look. I'll delete it as soon as I can, Raz. Delete it now before Goose catches us with it, I hiss. He saw us walk in with a camera. Let's just go, Pepper says. We'll do the scene somewhere else. The four of us head for the exit. The streaker must have distracted the other team really badly, because our school is actually winning now. That was crazy, Puppy says. She's driving us home in her car and shaking her head as Zor replays the footage we have. That's never happened here. Things have gotten weird at this school ever since you've shown up, Raz. What could I say, I ask. People lose their minds when they're around my artistic genius. Yeah, that's it, Pepper says sarcastically. I'm actually really pleased with the scenes we've done so far. Maybe this movie stands a chance. As long as there aren't any streakers in it, Zor chips in. Another week passes. I'm so involved in movie making that I don't realize I have another detention coming up until it's here. No doubt Mamie is going to pester the heck out of me for more details about Bethany. 
Sure enough, she's perched on her desk in the empty classroom when I arrive, hands clasped, looking like a reporter about to embark on a juicy new story. She hasn't told anybody anything, as far as I know, which impresses me. I was certain she was going to blab the whole thing to her friends the instant we left detention the last time. Once I take my seat and Goose goes out the door, she prods me for info. Come on, details! You promised me that you would tell me more! I roll my eyes. Relax, Mamie. I said I would. Okay, so after she stole the rings, Bethany and I started hanging out a lot. She would come over to my house every day, and we would walk around town. Bethany and I take the bus from Tin York to hang out at the mall. We're lounging outside of the building casually, watching shoppers pass us by. They give us suspicious looks. I know we look like the definition of delinquents. I don't have it in me to give a shit. Bethany is puffing on another cigarette. I don't know where she got them, and I'm not about to ask her. It's a bad habit, but there's no arguing with her. I've tried to get her to stop before, and no matter what I say, she won't give the things up. She can tell that I'm upset. She pulls the cigarette out of her mouth and asks, Raz, what's wrong? Another fight with my parents. My voice is blank and flat. It's the same thing every day. What about? I shake my head. Everybody's trying to tell me what to do with my life, my future. I should be able to decide what I want out of life. What do you want to do, Raz? I can't help the way my heart jumps when I say it. I want to be an actor. Then you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices, she says. It takes a lot to be famous. What do you mean? You have to do whatever it takes to fight your way to the top, she says simply, even if it means hurting people. I look down at the sidewalk. That's not what I was taught. You think you're going to make it big by being honest? This world spits on the good guy and makes the liars into gods. Cheaters prosper here, as long as they don't get caught. She taps some ash off the tip of her cigarette. I change the subject. You know you can get sick from those things. So? She asks. She takes a long drag and asks. <sighs> Want one? No thanks. The smoke gives me a headache. Your choice, she says. She smokes a little while longer before throwing the thing away. Come on, let's go do something. A pit of dread fills my stomach. Hanging with Bethany is sort of dangerous. She's always looking for some sort of temporary high. We go inside the mall and walk into a department store. She browses hungrily, her eyes scanning over the various items. I see a shiny pair of black Ray-Bans. I take the sunglasses off the shelf just to look at them. I'm dying to have them. My parents buy me whatever I need, but I don't really get a voice in what I want, and I know if I ask for them, I'll be told no. I check the price, wince, and put them back. Want them? Bethany asks. Yeah, I say. Really badly. Then why don't you get them, she says. Can't afford them, I shrug. Your point? She grabs the glasses and slips them into my jacket pocket, then gives me a wink. Bethany, I'm not stealing them. You want to be the best? Be like everybody else. Take what you want. She turns out her pockets to show me a handful of nail polish bottles. For good measure, she takes a pair of sunglasses for herself. With her back to the storekeeper, she saws off the security band around the glasses with a nail file. Let's move, she whispers. We walk out the front door. I start sweating, jumping at every corner. I'm waiting for a buzzer to go off, but it never does. Every time I see a security guard, I start thinking that I'm going to get arrested, but we pass by them easily. No one even notices. See, Bethany says on the bus ride home. Nothing happened, just like usual. Take what you want, Raz. That's what I was taught. I nod. I feel pretty bad about stealing the glasses, but it's only one pair, right? The store will notice they're gone and put another pair on the shelf the next day. I'm not hurting anybody. I stole from a big corporation, not a local store. I smile, a little thrill in my chest. I can't believe I actually got away with that. Over the next several days, me and Bethany go back to the mall and take more things. Shoes, clothes, nothing's off limits for us. My guilt fades with each new item I take. 
Eventually, it becomes a game for us, trying to see who can steal the best stuff without getting caught. I figured that the security guards are going to catch on, but they never do. By our fifth trip to the mall, we've stolen over a thousand dollars worth of stuff. One day, Bethany walks out with her biggest prize, a large bottle of vodka she snagged off a cooking store shelf. The stuff burns down my throat, and I kind of hate it, but we pass it back and forth anyway. I drink nearly half the bottle by myself, but Bethany can match me. I wonder how long she's been doing this. It's like she's a pro. By the time we get back to Tin York, I'm so roaring drunk that I can't even see straight. Bethany's drunker than I am, but she doesn't stop. She keeps drinking until she's laughing and throwing up at the same time on the sidewalk. Well, look who it is, a voice says nearby. I drunkenly look up to see Cayman standing there. The nerd and his little girlfriend. I never got back at you two for humiliating me in front of everyone. He cracks his knuckles. I grab the empty vodka bottle that Bethany's holding and chuck it at his head. It shatters against the side of his skull and cuts his face open. <laughs> he screams. My eye! You got my fucking eye! Piss off, I slur. I grab Bethany by the arm and drag her away. Everything blacks out after that. I wake up the next day with a terrible hangover. Somehow I ended up in my room. I stumble out of bed, throw my stolen sunglasses on, and go out to find Bethany. It turns out I left her under a bench in the middle of the park. I feel kind of bad about it, but she doesn't mind. She's too excited that I've taught Cayman a lesson. Despite my hangover, I can't deny how good I feel. I'm not invisible anymore. Not even Cayman has the balls to mess with me. Being a thief is sure better than being a nobody. I close my eyes. Mamie is silent when I finish my story. I think she's in shock. I know she wants to ask more questions, but Goose is back and we're out of time. We grab our things silently. Mamie doesn't speak as we walk out the door, cautious under Goose's stare. When we're out of Goose's hearing, I turn to Mamie nervously and ask, You don't think any less of me for it, do you? Mamie shakes her head, then thoughtfully says, no, Raz, I don't think any less of you for it. Chapter 5 It's the night of the homecoming dance. I procrastinated long enough that I don't have anything to wear. After a bit of digging, I find a neon green dress shirt with a vibrant purple tie and orange pants. Nausea inducing. Just what I wanted. I make sure to dress more and more outlandish every day to fit my raspberry sweet image, but this is really pushing it. I throw my sunglasses over my eyes and run my hands through my uncombed hair, ready. A car horn is honking outside. I wince as I think of Bethany, but I shake those thoughts out of my head. This is supposed to be a happy night. No flashbacks. Aunt Sarah pokes her head through the door and says, Raz, your ride's here. I turn and smile at her. She gets all teary-eyed. I suppress a groan as she walks over, hands extended with a goofy look on her face. You look so handsome. <laughs> Even in those ridiculous colors. And Sarah, I sigh. She sniffs. I remember helping to potty train you, and now look at you, a grown man. Brad, your girlfriend is here to pick you up. Mitzi bursts into my room and ruins my aunt's tender moment. I roll my eyes. Mitz, for the last time, she's not my girlfriend. Not yet, anyway. I don't see why you won't ask her out. Carmen's a very pretty girl, Aunt Sarah prods. I grab my wallet, tramp down the stairs, and head out the door. Yeah, okay, I hear you. Don't stay out too late, I add, ignoring the burning in my cheeks. Took you long enough, Puppy mumbles as I hop in the car. She doesn't take a second glance at my clothes. She's used to my crazy outfits by now. What's wrong with you? You're really red. Hey, you should have been in there just now. Real tearjerker, I say. I can't help but admit Puppy cleans up good. Her hair is up in a fancy bun, and the brown dress she bought fits her perfectly. For once, she's actually wearing makeup. She looks even more adorable than usual. Let's blow this popsicle stand, I say, and point onward. She drives away. 
I'm free to run away from my awkward house, my annoying cousin, and Bethany. I've never been to a high school dance. No one ever invited me, and I had nobody to hang out with, so there was no point in going. But I have friends now, people who actually care if I'm living or dead. Once we get there, though, I'm confused. Half of the lights in the school gym are still on, and there's no music playing. Everybody is standing around stupidly, including the DJ. I see Pepper in a slim black gown next to Soldier, who doesn't look anything like himself in a dress shirt and tie. Hey, where's Zor? I ask. Couldn't come. Soldier shakes his head. Glad you guys can make it, though. What's wrong with the lights? I ask, looking upward. Goose won't turn them off, Pepper replies bitterly. He thinks the darkness is going to lead to mischief, and the music isn't working. We're trying to find somebody's iPod to play. Are you serious? I ask. She nods, and I say, Well, we're still gonna have to have fun. It's better than no dance at all. Come on, people. Let's party. When they finally get the music going, I pull my friends onto the dance floor. I don't dance very well, but I came here to make a scene like always, so I force everyone to bob to the music with me while I practice my awkward white boy moves. Trouble. Puppy grabs my arm and points. We see Don and his girlfriend Madison arguing up a storm in the center of the dance floor. They always fight, but this time, Don looks pretty pissed. Soldier groans and says, I better step in so Don doesn't kill anyone. He walks over to the couple. I head over to the food table, but all the food has already been eaten. Puppy got one of the last sodas. This dance is really lame. I'm half considering ditching to go do something else, but that would be a Bethany move, so I stay here like a good boy. A slow song comes on, the first in about a half an hour of nothing but high-speed dubstep. My group moves to the side of the room and sits at a table, except for Puppy, who's dancing with some dude I don't know. As I watch her, I feel kind of jealous. I don't know how to hold hands or do any of that couple stuff. Looking at all these couples out on the dance floor is really sort of depressing. I glance at the guy holding Puppy. Lucky bastard, I think. I wish I was the one who got to hold her, but I don't have the guts to ask her to dance. While Puppy dances with the random guy, me and the rest of my friends are stuck in the corner of the room. Don and Madison are still fighting about ten feet away from us. Soldier has given up trying to break it up. Halfway through the song, Puppy steps away from the guy and comes back to us with a surly expression on her face. He's with another girl about five seconds later. I get up from my seat to comfort her, but end up tripping over a chair on the way. I fall flat on my face. Everybody nearby ends up laughing. Usually, I'd be happy that people think I'm funny, but the laughter I hear isn't friendly. It's cruel. They're laughing at me, not with me. I sprint for the bathroom to try and save my reputation. Soldier comes in right after me. Hey man, are you okay? He asks. I shake my head. I'm fine, alright? Just feeling stupid right now. What are you talking about? You love showing off to an audience. He chuckles. I shake my head. For once, I don't want the attention. Since when? Soldier asks. Come on, Raz. The girls are waiting. We go back to our table to find both Pepper and Puppy pouting. It looks like my clumsiness with the chair has been forgotten. I force a smile on my face. I'm supposed to be the optimistic one of the group, after all. I have to try and keep the spirit going. This dance sucks. Puppy crushes her empty can against the table. You guys want to hike across town to see Zor? But we're all dressed up, Pepper says. So? She shrugs. It'll be fun. Let's go. I'm all in. I don't even care anymore if ditching is a Bethany move. This dance sucks. We leave the dance and walk down the sidewalk in a group. Cars pass us by on the streets and honk. Even though the curfew for minors is 10 and it's well past midnight, the cop car that passes by us doesn't even take a second glance. I'm glad. I don't want any more memorable experiences with the police. The shops on Main Street are closed up for the night. It's very peaceful. I feel safe out here, with my friends. We cross a small bridge over the river. We're almost there. We're trying not to be loud, but we're failing epically because we're laughing so loud. Once we're at Zor's house, we creep up under his window. 
We all duck underneath it, laughing. Puppy knocks on the window and crouches down again. Zor comes up. Thinking it was his imagination, he goes away. We all take turns knocking on the glass. He goes back and forth between the window and his desk, peering between the shades but never seeing us. When it's my turn to knock, I can tell he's really freaked out. If it was me, I would have called the cops already, Soldier snickers. We finally go to the front door. He opens it up immediately when we ring the bell. I nearly explode. Zor's face is going to make me bust a gut. It looks like he's about to have a heart attack. His face is all pale, his muscles tight. He's breathing really, really hard, and his eyes are just about popping out of his head. He can't believe we all showed up on his front door to play a prank. Hey, Zor, Pepper says in a dreamlike voice. It makes me laugh harder. You guys! Zor shouts. He lunges for us, chasing us around the yard. We all make a bolt for it. I grab Puppy's hand and make her come with me. She doesn't mind. She can barely see straight. She's laughing so hard. Lights turn on in houses as we run by. Our loud voices wake up the whole neighborhood. By the time we make it back to the bridge, Puppy and I have to stop to catch our breath. In the moonlight, Puppy looks radiant. I lean over and gasp for air, my middle aching. So much better than a dance? Puppy says, catching my eye. I laugh and shake my head. So much better than a dance. We hook arms and smile at each other. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I love hanging out with you, Raz, Puppy says. You make everything ten times better. Oh, really? I say, casting a wayward smile at her. I didn't know I had that effect on you. She looks down and mutters. Yeah, well, most people don't. My stomach is doing somersaults. Ah, uh, should we go back and get the others? No. She takes my hand, walking close. Right now, I just want to be with you. I swear to God, right then, I'm glowing inside. A few days after homecoming, it's finally here. The entire study hall period has been waiting for this day. Pepper said we should start filming the fight scene, the giant battle between the zombies and humans. Everybody can take part in this, even Wizard, who is insisting on having a part of the action. I'll be a human who tries to take down the Lord Zombie, Wizard says, waving his samurai sword at Soldier. It's the only part I want. The special effects are going to make me catch on fire, Ola shouts. I bought a fake arm. If you hit it just right with this baseball bat, it'll come flying off, Don proclaims. Everyone's got an idea on how they want their part of the fight scene to go. Myself, I'll be helping Puppy fend off multiple zombies. I open the door for her as we go out into the school courtyard. Everyone else is preparing for the fight scene. Okay, people, Pepper shouts. This is one of the most intense scenes of the movie. Zora has already put together music for this part, and we won't do it justice if we don't make it look real. Make sure you're fighting all the time, even if you don't think the camera's on you. Andy, you're in the wrong place. Move over there. Ella, fix your face paint. It's smudged all over your lips. I turn to Puppy. You ready to kick some zombie ass? She's pretty still, unlike me, who is bouncing back and forth. As ready as you are, she whispers. I beam at her, but she doesn't smile back. She seems hesitant, as if she wants to ask a question and is unsure if it'll upset me or not. Did I do something wrong at homecoming? Did we get too close? Or have I done something else to make her mad? Puppy, what's wrong? You seem quiet, I whisper. She turns to me with a sigh and says, I never did find out the truth about Bethany, you know. Of course, I knew this was coming. Not now, puppy, I say, keeping my voice low. Why not now? She asks harshly. You're telling Mick how Mamie all about it in detention, so why haven't you said anything to me? I thought we were friends. I open my mouth to ask how she knows about that, but before I can, Pepper yells, Action! And the fight scene begins. Puppy is supposed to be grabbing zombies and taking them down. I wonder if Puppy will actually start attacking me instead, but she seizes the only poor freshman in our class and pretends to slam him into the dirt. I kick down Bobby and turn around to look for Puppy, but she's already gone. It's a good thing we have several camera angles with a big film crew this time, because if we didn't, everything would look really, really fake. 
Most people aren't even touching each other as they pretend to do battle. I hope it comes together well once Wizard edits it, because it's absolute craziness. Some scenes have been set up, but overall, it's mostly improvisation. People are doing the wildest things. I'm not sure if Frank and Katie are pretending to wrestle or doing a dance. Though one move looks pretty real. Wizard runs forward, the samurai sword in his hands, and prepares to strike down Soldier. Soldier raises his fist and punches Wizard right in the jaw. The dude hits the ground flat. It looks so real that everybody else stops fighting to look at Wizard, who is on the ground. Pepper yells, Cut! Did you get that? I've got it! Brody says, and he races forward with the camera. He comes to a stop by Soldier's side and says, That was a great shot! How'd you fake it? I didn't, Soldier says, and he looks down at Wizard. I really hit him. All becomes silent. Pepper's mouth drops open and she says, Soldier, you didn't. Soldier nudges Wizard's still body. I think I may have knocked him out. Everybody starts mumbling lowly. Will somebody please take the man to the nurse? Pepper asks. She rubs her forehead, irritated. Don and Bobby look at each other before they carry Wizard away. The kid really is out of it. Soldier rubs the back of his head and says, It was an accident. I had better go with him. Be there when he wakes up. Pepper shakes her head and says, Okay, people, from the top. And this time, can we please try not to cause unconsciousness? There are mumbles of agreement. Pepper yells, Action! And the chaos starts up again. Throughout the fake fight, I'm still looking for Puppy. One kid nearly bloodies this other kid's nose and they get into a shoving match. It looks pretty good until it starts to get serious and a couple of zombie kids have to pretend to be attacking them in order to pull the two away from each other. So much for avoiding violence. Finally, I find her, struggling with some zombie guy who is pretending to bite her arm. I fake punch him and he crawls away. I go to speak to her, but she runs away from me again. She's using the fight take to avoid me. Not cool. Perry is doing something really odd. His face is scrunched up, and he's wriggling up and down like some sort of caterpillar on the grass. Stop, stop, stop! Pepper jumps off her chair and waves her arms around. Perry, what is that? Perry stops shaking on the ground. It's a seizure. My character is having traumatic stress from the incident around him and is reacting to his environment. Perry, we're trying to do a movie, not creating an arc for a background character that nobody knows anything about, Pepper says with a tired voice. But you don't understand! I, we worked for hours on his backstory! Perry argues. I haven't even seen the revised script. I know you're a writer, but... At Perry's wide-eyed face, Pepper takes a deep sigh. Can you tone it down a bit, at least? Fine, he agrees and goes back to twitching. Pepper adjusts her glasses. This is a disaster. She shakes her head and says... Puppy, Raz, go back to the classroom and try to find some sort of prop we could use. It may help. The rest of you, try rehearsing something that looks like a fight. The two of us glance at each other quickly. I'm not surprised to find Puppy doesn't look happy. We head back inside the school and toward the auditorium. The silence between us is practically eating me alive. Puppy won't look me in the eye. I grab her arm and say, Puppy, you're avoiding me. And, she asks. She pulls away from me and continues down the hall. Puppy, seriously, what's your problem? Why aren't you talking to me? I ask. Oh, no reason. Puppy rolls her eyes. Only that you've decided to get cozy with my worst enemy, that's all. We enter the classroom in silence and ruffle through the boxes of props that people have brought from home. How did you even know we were talking? I found out you were in detention together. I knew Mamie would try to squeeze some sort of information out of you, and I was right. Mamie's not as bad as we thought she was. Puppy stops going through boxes. Really? I bet you would tell her anything she wants to hear, just because you think she's hot. You know me better than that. Do I? I don't know. I didn't know you were hanging out with Bethany Cade either. Her voice is dripping with disappointment. It reminds me of my mom. You don't even know who Bethany is, I say, my voice rising. I don't have to! She shows in the way you act! Puppy shoves a box aside roughly. You know nothing about what happened to me over the summer! 
I shout. Nothing! Only because you won't tell me! When I don't reply, she turns on her heel and walks toward the exit. She wrenches open the door and says, Just leave me alone, Raz. Go find Mamie and get some sugar. She leaves. As she slams the door, I yell, Get some sugar? My disastrous experience with Puppy is still lurking around in my thoughts when I show up at my last detention this afternoon. I really don't feel like recounting my summer escapade with Bethany to Mamie, especially right now, but I made her a promise. This time, when I sit down, she doesn't pounce on me. Mamie waits patiently, while I stall and talk to her about other things to get her mind off the topic. It doesn't work. I begin to tell her the story once more, and a weight is lifted off my chest as we begin. Where were we? Oh yeah, the best part of the story, I say sarcastically. Hold on to your seat, because things get really bad here. Dust is rising off the road. I look out the window to see someone driving a red sports car up our driveway. Nobody I know drives a car like that. I'm shocked when the driver's side window rolls down. Bethany is behind the wheel. I open the door and ask, Bethany, is that your new car? No, I'm just borrowing it for the day, she says. There's a glint in her eyes. Want a ride? We can go where we want. The tank is full. I hesitate. We've snuck out before, but never in a car. We can't be gone long. My parents will be back soon. They won't even know we left. I slam the door and plan to hop in shotgun, but when I turn around, she's already sitting in the passenger side. You're driving, she says, and she tosses me the keys. I catch the keys and look down. I've only got my permit, not a license, I say warily. Big deal. I don't even have a permit and I didn't get caught. You know you want to drive this thing. She strokes the dashboard. I do. Driving makes me nervous, but this vehicle is drop-dead gorgeous. I'd be dumb to refuse a chance to drive it. I go to the driver's side, buckle in, and put my hands on the shiny wheel. It makes a beautiful purr as I rev the engine. In seconds, we're down the road. Now you're getting it, Bethany smiles. She pulls out a cigarette, but I say, No, not in the car. Put it away. Um, excuse me? I'm the one borrowing it. And I'm the one driving. Cut the crap, Smokey. She pretends to scowl, but she's in too good of a mood to argue. She rolls the window down, letting out a happy holler. We avoid the main highway and take winding rural paths until we aren't even sure where we are anymore. We turn the radio on full blast, then shut it off just so we can talk. There's nothing to be worried about except the wide, open sky. Our moseying takes us to a smaller city. I realize with a shock that we're in Norton, which is about two hours away from Tin York. We drove way further than I thought we did. I'm bored, Bethany says abruptly. She looks around the town for a distraction. Once she sees one, her eyes light up. I cross the country line and she says, Zoom past that police car over there. What? Are you crazy? It's a speed trap, I protest. She smiles. Exactly. Bet you could drive faster than he can. Yeah, I don't think so. Sit back and enjoy the ride, I say. But just as I'm passing the trooper, Bethany grabs the steering wheel and jerks it to the side. I wrench it back to steady the car, but can't correct it fast enough. I end up crashing into a lamppost and a sign, running them both over. The police lights come on, and the whir of the siren blares out. Drive, boy, drive! Bethany screams, and I panic. My foot finds the accelerator, and within seconds, I'm going 80 in a 40 mile per hour zone. I look in the rearview mirror, and my stomach plummets as I realize the cop's chasing us. Bethany cries out, Speed up! I do, swerving to avoid crashing into trees on the sharp turns. Bethany, this is nuts! I'm pulling over! I whimper. She looks at me with wide eyes and says, You can't! If they catch us, we'll be arrested! It's only a hit and run on a lamppost and a sign! I'll get in more trouble for running away! I argue. If you stop now, we're going to be arrested for stealing a car, you idiot! She screams. My heart is pounding out of my chest. I thought you were borrowing this car from someone you knew! I'll return it if you don't crash it up, she says snippily. She looks back at the police cruiser and says, 
Because there's no way he could catch up. This car can go way faster than that police cruiser. You think? My speed keeps on increasing. Apparently, he's called for backup, because now there are two cops chasing us. I nearly clip several cars as I go around them. The intensity increases. Bethany? I whine. We've gotta stop. Do you really want to go to jail for Grand Theft Auto? You're the one driving, not me! She screams. I swear to God, I'll play the victim if they catch us and say you made me do it! A policeman pulls out in front of us from seemingly nowhere. Instinctively, I slam on the brakes. The car spins out of control, and the world turns into a blur. My head spins in circles when the car comes to a stop. By the time I've got my bearings, Bethany is bleeding from the head. She's knocked out. She hit her head on the dash. Before I can even comprehend what's happening, there's a big guy at my window pointing a gun in my face. Get out of the car! He orders. Shocked, I exit the vehicle and hold my hands up in the air. He roughly pushes me against the vehicle, searching me for anything I may be carrying in my pockets. Once he's sure I don't have a bazooka in my jacket, he handcuffs me and reads me my rights. There's a female in blue coming up. By the look on her face, she was expecting some hardcore, diehard criminal. Ah, jeez, this one's just a kid, she says. For some weird, ridiculous reason, I think how great of a movie this would make. Kid or not, he shouldn't have ran. The officer shakes his head as he pulls me over to the cop car. I'm put in the back of the cruiser. They drive to the station with me, the getaway driver in tow. Out of all things, I really didn't expect to get arrested today. What were you thinking, driving that car like that? The cop asks. I remain silent and can't answer. My mouth opens and closes a few times like a fish's. I don't think you're going to get much out of this kid. He's all white. Looks like he's in shock, his female partner says. He should be! He could have killed a lot of people today! He growls. Could have killed people. I feel like I'm going to drown. What a stupid decision I made. And it only took seconds to decide. They pull me into the station and the woman goes up to the front desk. The handcuffs cut into my wrists, but I don't dare to ask if they can take them off. The cop guides me over to a chair and tells me to sit down. I do so. He picks up a phone, asking me who my parents are. In a voice that's not my own, I ramble out some names. I can hear the voice on the other line. It's my dad. The cop clears his throat and says, Hello, sir, is this the sweet residence? I can hear dad say yes in a confused tone. This is Officer Sam Isle from the Sheriff's Office. I need you to come in and clarify some things. Your son has been arrested. Has been arrested. My parents are gonna kill me. I can't go on. Mamie looks at me with wide eyes and asks, So what happened? I shrug. They put us on trial. Bethany went to Juvenile Hall because she had done some other illegal stuff. She wasn't 16 yet, so they couldn't try her as an adult like me. I was already 17 by the time this happened. What other stuff had she done? Mostly drugs and petty theft. I got community service after I explained my story and a huge fine. I barely avoided jail. I turned my head away. They took away my permit and banned me from getting my license for the next seven years. Once I was done with community service... My parents shipped me to my aunt and uncle's here in Limesville. Mamie forces a smile. Hey, don't be upset. Half of the actors nowadays have trouble with the law. You've already got a record, so you're ahead of the game. Yeah, I'm just a regular outlaw. I smirk. I chuckle, but stop when we see a figure outside. The door opens. Goose contorts his face into a sneer. Your detentions are over and you've served your time. Stay out of trouble, or you can be sure you'll be back here again. The threat is obviously directed toward me. I give Goose a cold stare. Mamie and I head toward the parking lot so she can wait for somebody to give her a ride. I'm walking home, but I want to make sure somebody picks her up, so she's safe. Her ride comes to get her really late. Mamie reluctantly waves goodbye before getting into the car. Something doesn't seem right. The guy driving the car... Her new boyfriend leans over to kiss her. She pushes him away. He slaps her across the face, yelling as he does so. The reason why Mamie wears so much makeup hits me like that guy's slap. I want to do something. 
I want to pull her out of that car and tell her that she deserves better. But I can't do anything. I'm frozen on the spot, completely useless as I see the tears welling up in Mamie's eyes as they drive away. I know exactly how she feels. Once I get home, I completely crumble. I'm glad that no one's home to see it. I know that I have to pull myself together before school tomorrow, slip on this monster called Raspberry Sweet, but right now, I can't do it. I'm unable to stop the flashbacks. They come in waves, pinning me to the bed and holding me down. It's sunset when I'm finally let go from community service. All I had to do was pick up trash and give one of the bridges a fresh coat of paint. A lot better than prison, I figure. I head back to my house, feeling lucky that I managed to escape going to jail. When I round a corner at the edge of Ten York, I freeze. Cayman's there, his hands bunched into fists and giving me a terrible smile. There's a bandage over the place where the bottle I threw struck him. I've heard rumors he lost his eye because of it. There's something in his one good eye that makes me feel like he's lost all sense of humanity. I've been waiting for you, sweet. I run. I turn on my heels and head straight for the middle of town, but he's faster than I am. He grabs me by the back of my neck and tosses me on the ground. I try to fight back, but I'm useless at brawling. He kicks me in the stomach, then drags me into an abandoned warehouse before tossing me into darkness. He starts by beating the shit out of me. Cayman doesn't hesitate. He pummels his fists into my face until one of my eyes is swelled shut and my mouth starts bleeding. I know I can't take him, so I try to block his hits unsuccessfully. I just want him to leave me alone. His fists don't hurt as much as his hatred. I can tell by the look on his face he's having the time of his life tormenting me. By the eighth time he punches me, I'm swaying on my feet. Why do you hate me so much? I ask, blood dripping from my mouth. The room's spinning. If he hits me again, I'm going to pass out. I don't hate you, sweet, he says, laughing. I just get a kick out of making you feel like the useless piece of garbage you are. You're nothing but a toy to me. He kicks my feet out from under me and pins me to the floor. He presses his hand up against my neck and chokes the air from my lungs. I'm gonna make you suffer, sweet, he hisses into my ear. You're gonna wish someone heard you scream when I'm done with you. I wish I blacked out, but I didn't. Almost an hour later, came and leaves me curled up in a ball on the warehouse floor, amongst all the broken glass and fragments of nails. It was fun, sweet. Came and gets up with a laugh and spits on me. Let's do it again sometime. He prowls away arrogantly, and I shiver against the concrete. The sun falls lower and lower outside until it's completely dark and I'm cold. I don't want to walk home alone, but I have no choice. I force myself to climb to my feet and put one foot in front of the other in an absolute haze. Everything seems so surreal, so cloudy. I can't form a coherent thought in my head. All I can do is replay what happened. I want to cry, but I can't. Cayman has ripped everything away from me, rearranged it, and then thrown it back. I can't even begin to piece together the mess he created. Cayman's erased everything I know and torn it to pieces. A part of me knows that I should go to the hospital, that I should tell the police, even though they wouldn't take me seriously because of my record. I want to tell someone. Anyone. But the one person who I would tell is gone, and I don't trust anyone else. Now that Bethany's in juvie, I have no friends. There isn't a single person on earth who's going to believe me right now. I feel utterly and completely alone. Mildred, what happened? My mother says as I come into the house. You look awful. I tripped, I say immediately. Fell down a flight of stairs at community service. If you weren't so clumsy, you wouldn't have tripped, my father sneers. He doesn't even bother to look up at me from behind the paper he's reading. Be more careful. I don't know how many times I have to tell you that before it sinks in, my mother snaps. And for God's sake, go wash up. You're dripping blood all over my spotless floor. I go to the bathroom and turn on the shower. 
I stand under the steady stream and watch as the water turns red. I don't get out until the water goes cold. I wrap a towel around my waist and notice that I'm bleeding heavily from several cuts around my face, among other places. I know my parents won't help me. I have to take care of myself. I take a couple bandages from the box and try to put them on, but they won't stay. I angrily throw the box across the room and take a look at myself in the mirror. That's when I dissolve into tears. I sink to the floor, completely lost. I'm trying to quiet my voice enough so my parents won't hear, because they don't like crying, but I can barely contain the sound of my sobs. I feel like screaming. I don't even know who I am anymore. I hate myself. Chapter 6 So how are the special effects going, Wiz? Soldier asks. Wizard presses a button on the keyboard. It's going good. I was able to turn this scene. He presses another button. Into an explosion. On screen, several zombies go flying as a computer-generated bomb goes off. I'm amazed at Wizard's knack for technology. The special effects are actually pretty decent, for a high school kid. Hold on, I say, pointing to the screen. Where are Andy's legs? Pardon? Wizard asks. He changes into a zombie at this point, right? Why are his legs suddenly ripping off of him and then disappearing? I ask as I watch the scene over. I'll have to work on that, Wizard mumbles. He puts his tongue between his teeth as he goes to fix the small mistake. I'm glad I have the movie for a distraction. I had a complete meltdown last night, one that I barely concealed from my aunt and uncle. I didn't sleep at all. There are bags under my eyes, and I know I'm on edge, but so far, nobody has noticed. I don't want to be Mildred, the kid who was assaulted in the back of a dirty warehouse. Today, I just want to be Raspberry Sweet. Guys, Don says, catching our attention. Brody is at his side. They look pretty panicked, which means this can't be good. I stand up and ask, What's wrong? The camera broke, Brody groans. We were playing around with it in the bathroom, and it fell into the toilet and drowned the battery. You clowns were tossing it around and it landed in the toilet? Puppy asks. After all that hard work? All the scenes are on my computer. Don't worry, Wizard assures us. Though how we're going to film the rest, I'm not sure. That was our best camera. Crap. We're more than halfway through the movie. We can't waste all that hard work and not finish. I look into the devastated faces of our team, but I refuse to give in. We're not beaten yet. No worries, guys, I say. I'll just go ask Miss Sue if we can borrow one of her cameras. Miss Sue is the director of technology at the school. She'll have what we need. You two go, then. Pepper points to Puppy and I. She likes you guys. She ought to lend you one. Puppy sighs. We turn on our heels and head out the door. It takes forever to walk to Miss Sue's room. The going is silent, just as awkward as it was before. I sort of wish Pepper had sent me with somebody else instead of Puppy. We still aren't really talking, not since our argument. I'm relieved when we finally enter Miss Sue's room and go up to her desk. Even then, Puppy won't look me in the eye. Ah, oh, Carmen, Raz, Miss Sue says. What's up? Puppy opens her mouth to speak, but I beat her to it. We're making a... school project, and our camera has... malfunctioned. We need a replacement, and we were wondering if... You could borrow one of the schools? Miss Sue asks, cutting me off. Sure, you just need to sign one out. She hands me a bunch of golden keys on a loop. They're in the storage room, along the catwalks. You can find them, right? It'll be no problem, Puppy says, signing her name on the camera waiver. Inwardly, I relax. At least if this one gets toileted, my name won't be on the sheet to be hung. I always recheck it every night, so I'll know if anything's missing, Miss Sue says with a teasing smile. Good luck with your project. Unhappy to be alone with Puppy again, I make way for the door. The walk to the auditorium is even longer and no less uncomfortable. Every muscle in me is tense. I'm longing for the moment when we return to the classroom with the extra camera. Every step I take makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong. As we go into the auditorium and I reach the stage, that familiar smell of fresh carpet and dusty lighting climbs to my nostrils. 
I take a deep breath and smile, despite the coldness from Puppy. You really love this stuff, don't you? Puppy asks softly. For once, she's not being sarcastic. I nod, not taking my eyes off the stage. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think if I had a choice, you'd never get me off the stage. We navigate around the props until we reach the winding staircase. Going up this thing makes me dizzy. I don't know how Miss Sue does it every day. I trip several times up the stairs before we finally reach our destination. The catwalks are long strips of black metal hooked to the ceiling that go back to the attic of the school. The catwalks are used for spotlights, and sometimes to record the plays. I like it up here. It's breathtaking. Railings are the only thing that keep me from tripping over the side. Even then, I may go over anyway, because I'm such a klutz. Like the drop? Puppy asks, noticing my pale expression. I look down again. The stage looks like a desk from up here. Do you think if I... I swallow. If all over the side that I live... I think you'll be splattered all over the seats, and the janitors will have to use a spatula to clean you up. Puppy moves across the catwalks like she owns them. That's another thing I love about her. She never acts scared or unconfident. She takes control of everything. We come to the storage room. Once I reach the door, I grab the keys. I feel a little self-conscious as I try key after key, forgetting which one Miss Sue pointed out to me. Puppy's eyes are drilling a hole into my back, and her foot is tapping against the floor. Finally, I get the right one. I struggle with the door before it finally swings open. We turn on the light and see cords, light boxes, extra electronics. Here we go, Puppy says, and she grabs a camera. She puts it in her bag and says, Make sure you lock the door on your way out. Hold up, I call after her. She still keeps walking away and I whine. Don't leave. Leaving, Raz. Lock the door, she repeats. I let out a long, groaning sigh. She stops and turns to look at me. Puppy, I say tiredly. What's happening to us? I don't know what you mean, she says casually. Yes, you do, I snap. As friends, we're falling apart. Why are you avoiding me? She looks down. It's complicated. Then tell me, I plead. I want to know what's going on. It's not important. Yes, it is, I protest. It's important to me. Is it about Mamie? She shakes her head. It's more than that. Then let's talk it out, please. I, I don't want to lose you as a friend. Or anything else. Puppy sighs. I give her a desperate, pleading look, and she caves. Puppy goes over to an old, ragged couch in the storage room that's probably been up here for ages. She lies down on it, her hand on her head. I guess I'm just upset that you told Mamie everything, and I don't know anything, which sucks, because you're my best friend. I blank. I'm your best friend? I thought you were. I haven't known you for that long, but I feel closer to you than the others. This is hard for her to admit. I've never had a best friend before. The confession means everything to me. I don't want you to think badly of me for what I did, I say. I sit down on the opposite end of the couch. She throws her legs over mine. But I don't, Raz. She sits up. I just want to know. I cross my arms and look away, sullen. Telling Mamie was easy, because she doesn't know anything about me. Puppy, though, she understands me better than anyone else I know. Even though I've only known her for a couple of weeks, I've come to care about her more than anyone else at Limesville High. The opinions of people you care about hurt way more than those you don't. If Puppy ever thought I was a bad person, it would kill me. She plays with her hands and says, you know, my parents don't want me hanging out with you. Not since they found out that you and Bethany. Raz, for my sake and sanity, just tell me. She's doing it again, giving me that puppy dog look. I try to hold back, but my reserve fails. I spill. I tell her everything in as much detail as I can, leaving one very critical, crushing part out. The bell for the next class rings, as well as the bell after that but we ignore it. The teachers will be looking for us to see if we ditched, but we don't care. 
This is more important. When I'm done, Puppy stares down at the stage below. I shift on the couch and say, You're mad at me. Yeah, I am, she huffs. Raz, how could you be so stupid? Bethany was nice to me. I had no one else, I say. A lot of people are nice to you, like Mamie. We're not back on her again, are we? Come on, puppy. Let it go, I beg. We're quiet again, but this quiet is a contemplative quiet, not an uneasy one. Puppy shakes her head and says quietly, Come on, Raz. Let's go. I follow her back downstairs. The hallways are empty. I realize that school got out fifteen minutes ago. I missed the bus, I say to her. Did you drive today? No. She shakes her head. But my mom will come pick us up if I call her. Will she let me ride with you guys? I ask, remembering what was said earlier about her parents not trusting me. She can't just leave you here, Puppy says. I'll tell her you'll be riding along. She nudges me before giving me an encouraging smile. I smile back at her, but I can't deny how stupid I feel. Telling Puppy was a lot different than telling Mamie, and they both took the story completely differently. No matter what Puppy said, I'm still worried about what she thinks of me. Puppy's opinion of me means the world. Bethany would be ashamed. The day afterward is Soldier's birthday party. We're going out to play paintball in the cold, dreary weather, an event that we've all been looking forward to for months. He greets us in the kitchen, and we start loading up our guns with orange paintballs. I lift my gun up onto my shoulder, and there's a loud bang. It goes silent in the house. We all look at each other, then the ceiling. Be glad that thing wasn't loaded, Sora says, giving me an annoyed look. You would have splattered paint all over the ceiling. Sorry, I laugh shakily. I guess I'm not good with guns. Really? I wouldn't hand you a gun if my life depended on it, Pepper teases. Come on, guys, hurry up, Soldier says. We're losing the sun. We head out in the twilight. Puppy puts her face mask down as we walk along the dirt road and into the open, grassy field. Right, she says. Teams? You, Zor, and Raz against Pepper and I, Soldier says. You're good, so is Zor, and I'm excellent. We all know Pepper's never done it before, and I bet Raz can't shoot to save his life. Excuse me? I ask. I lift my gun onto my shoulder again, and all the paintballs fall out of the back compartment. We stoop down to pick them up, and I mumble. Point taken. I'll give you guys a one minute start. Go! Soldier says. Somebody pushes me into the high grass, and I lead the way, jogging into the bushes military style, with Zora and Puppy following. I'm so intent on watching for our enemy that I trip in a hole and fall on my face. When this happens, Puppy whispers, Get down! My friends fling themselves to the grass, crawling into the pine trees. Only a few minutes pass until we see Pepper and Soldier coming. Puppy raises her gun and says, Wait, aim, fire! We lob paintballs at them like no tomorrow. Pepper is hit and goes down almost instantly, but Soldier must have heard us coming. He avoids everything we shoot at him, dancing amongst the weeds as if coals were under his feet. I'm pumping my gun like a maniac, but no paintballs are coming out. One paintball flies out of my gun and nearly whaps him in his face mask, but that's about it. My gun won't work! I shout. The others look back at me, confused. It's Soldier's turn. He shoots. A paintball zings right for Zor, hitting him on the ass. Ah! Of all the places to get hit! He yells. He throws his gun to me and I shoot once out of that one, but that freezes up too. What's wrong with these things? I complain. How did I manage to mess this up too? Puppy yells, Let's go! We retreat as Soldier closes in, holding on to two useless guns. We come to a field of corn. Puppy pushes me inside and we go back to back, me with my useless gun and Puppy pretty much fending for herself. You're a nuisance, you know that? She asks. I snicker until she shushes me. We travel through the tall plants that are weaving back and forth like ghosts. Soldier could be anywhere. Ruah! He screams as he jumps upon us. Puppy is taken out and falls to the ground as paintballs hit her by the dozen. I run for it. Soldier's laughing, shooting paintball after paintball at me. Several hit me at once and I scream. 
Ow! Soldier, cut it out! Ow! He only laughs harder. He raises his arms up in the air and screams. Victory! Great, Pepper says, wiping off her face mask that's full of paint. She and Zora have arrived, covered in orange. Can we play it again? Maybe, I say. My gun's sorta of broke. You malfunctioned mine too, Zora whines, attempting to shoot his gun and failing. That only goes to show you all that I am the king of paintball! Soldier says, his voice loud and booming. I would have gotten you if my gun hadn't have backed up, I mumble. Yeah, sure, Soldier says. He looks at me and Zora and says, since you guys don't have guns, we'll give you five seconds to run. One, two... Move, Zor! I scream and we run like hell as the three of them chase us with their guns, lobbing paintball after paintball after us as we feebly try to take cover behind bushes and trees. This continues for a while until the sun is set and it's too dark out to see anything. I'm so sore from paintballs hitting me that it hurts to move. It's almost eight, Pepper says, looking up at the sky. We should be heading back. The five of us walk along the path together. Zora and Soldier are punching each other, and Puppy's just told Pepper a joke that's making her gasp for breath. Zora sneaks up behind her and grabs her around the waist, lifting her off the ground as he spins her round and round. They crash into Puppy and Soldier. All my friends end up falling in the dirt, laughing. I smile as I watch them mess around. How in the world did a bunch of misfits like us end up together? More importantly, how did I manage to find such a great group of people that like me? Actually like me. My eyes fall on Puppy. The wind is ruffling her soft, brunette hair, and the setting sun makes her look the same way she did that evening on the bridge. My stomach turns and I nervously glance down. Raz, are you okay? Puppy asks. Yeah, don't worry about it. I say absentmindedly. It's just really cold out here. When we reach the house to feast on pizza, Soldier comes out of his bedroom with an astonished look on his face. You nearly ruined my gun, Raz, Soldier says. I was getting the paintballs out and you had eight of them cramped in the barrel. Is that even possible? With Raz, it is. Pepper rolls her eyes. She flips to a movie on the TV, but we barely watch it because we're talking so much. Puppy's sitting on the other side of me. Our legs are touching as she leans against me in a tired sort of way. A friend sort of way. It makes me both happy and uncomfortable. Raz, what is your deal tonight? Pepper asks as I begin bouncing up and down on the couch. <laughs> no idea, I laugh and my voice shakes. I'm just really, really hyper. What's making you bounce off the walls? Soldier asks. You're acting like a little kid. Like I said, I don't know. I shake my head quickly back and forth. I just feel like... running. So far and so fast that I'm far enough away from everyone, but close enough that my friends are with me. You're weird, Raz, Pepper says. Very weird, Soldier adds. You're completely, utterly, and totally anything but ordinary, Sor quips. I look at Puppy again. I can tell by the look on her face that she is amused by my antics. Yep, I say, and you guys wouldn't want it any other way. Chapter 7 On Monday during lunch, Puppy is pulled away by Goose to talk about something. We all watch as the principal takes her to a corner of the lunchroom and starts berating her. He's yelling as loudly as he can without calling the attention of everyone in the room. What does Max Goose want now? Pepper moans. Probably wants to complain to her about walking in the halls without a pass or something, Soldier says, cramming his face with fries. I peer over Zora and wonder why Goose looks so demanding and stern. It's way more than his usual tough cop act, which is saying something. I glance down as Puppy looks back at me. I don't like the expression on her face. She seems upset. My cheeks are burning. I see the way everyone's pretending not to notice. There's no way around it. I like Puppy. I mean, I really, really like Puppy. It's so obvious that everyone else has realized it. Even Puppy has probably noticed. A pit forms in my innards as I realize the truth. Duh, Puppy noticed. That's why she's been acting so weird lately. She probably doesn't like me back. 
I can't understand why I like her in the first place. She was so mean to me at first. But then, for some reason, we just clicked. Her sarcasm and harsh comments aren't meant to be hurtful. Her words are a way to hide how much she cares. If anybody could make me feel better about what happened to me this summer, it'd be Puppy. I sink against the table, my hands in my hair. Do I love her? I know the answer before I even have to think about it. Yeah, I love her. Nothing I do can take my mind off of Puppy. Even making the movie doesn't get her out of my head. What the heck is taking so long? I glance back over at Puppy and Goose. Tears are starting to form in Puppy's eyes. What's going on? Puppy never cries. I'm about to go to her, but before I can, she's heading back to the table to pick up her bags. What's wrong? Pepper asks, concerned. Puppy blinks away angry tears. All the stuff from the storage room above the stage is gone. It's completely cleaned out. Since I was in there yesterday, Goose is blaming me for it. What? I jump up. That's insane! Besides, I'm the one who... Who... Oh, damn. I forgot to lock the door. I go to her side and say, Puppy, you can't take the blame. Seriously, I'll vouch for you. Your parents don't like me as it is. I don't want them to think that I got you in trouble after I left the door open. Ras, she says quietly, they think you took the stuff. Her words slam into me. I fall back into my chair and ask, They think I stole all that equipment? They sure do. They wouldn't believe me when I said you were with me the whole time. She closes her eyes and two tears leak out of them. How was I supposed to take all that stuff? I don't have a car to put it in or a place to keep it, I hiss. I don't know, Raz. They just know that I went with you. They think that all the time we spent ditching class to talk was used to take the stuff. They only just found out now because Miss Sue decided to go home without checking the storage area over the weekend. They're looking at your record and putting two and two together. My friends are looking at me weirdly. They don't know about my record. But they're about to find out. Goose is going to come for me. In fact, he's staring at me across the lunchroom right now. If I'm convicted of this crime, I'll definitely go to jail. I won't get a second chance this time. I have to get home, I whimper. No, Raz. Zor shakes his head. If you run now, then that'll make you look guilty. Stay here. Just call your aunt and uncle and let them tear up the school for accusing you of theft, Soldier suggests. You guys don't understand! I scream. I can't go to prison! Take it easy, Raz! Soldier grabs onto my shoulders. They're not taking you anywhere. Not with me around. You don't know that for certain. I pull away. I don't run. I think about the party we had last Saturday. That seems so far away now. So distant. Was I ever really that happy? Did that day ever exist? All I can feel now is a bitter chill. We're going to fix this, Ras, Pepper says. Her voice is calming and clear. You're going to be found innocent, and Goose is going to eat his words. They can't prove you guilty. There's no evidence. We're going to solve everything. Our Pepper. So organized. So straightforward. If only I could believe her. I'm suspended until further notice. I didn't know the school could actually do that. Ban me without a reason. But I'm thinking that because of my criminal history, the board has made an exception. Aunt Sarah came and screamed at the office until you could hear her from down the hall, but with Goose, it hardly made a difference. She tells me she's going to get a lawyer, but I know better. We can't afford one. Her sticking up for me makes me adore her. My mom wouldn't have done that. If anything, my mother would have helped them take me away. I'm stuck on the couch the next day, feeling sick. I watch out the window for the rainy storm that's heading our way. Mitzi comes in after school, her hair wet all over. No words are needed. She sees how hurt I am and comes near. Why'd you do it, Raz? Mitzi asks, and she cocks her head. I didn't take the stuff, Mitzi, I growl. Not that, Mitzi shakes her head. Why'd you hang out with Bethany? Didn't you know she was bad news? I'm silent. 
Mitzi curls up on the couch next to me. I wrap my arm around her and say, Yeah, I did. I just didn't want to believe it. There's a knock on my door. I get up to open it, feeling half dead. I'm shocked to find that my study hall class is outside, clustered in a group like penguins and braving the weather. Goose or no goose, Pepper starts. I'm the director and I say we're still making the movie. Do you mind if we all, uh, come in? I choke up. I can't help it. Nobody's ever bothered to show up to my house to help me before, let alone a whole classroom of people. Yeah, uh, I say and I clear my throat. Come in. I let them all through. One by one, they file into the house until there's at least 15 people standing in my living room. Puppy's in the corner. She won't meet my eyes. What scene are we on, Pepper? Mamie asks. She's brought her makeup case along. One of the most important, Pepper says. The one where the main characters chase after the zombie leader and destroy him. The setting is perfect. Just what Perry and Ola wrote. A blustery and stormy day. Can I be in the movie too? Missy asks as she leans over the armrest. You can be the little girl I kidnapped, Soldier tells Mitzi, and he swings her up onto his shoulder. Let's do it, Brody says. He's already got the borrowed camera ready. I'm surprised Miss Sue let us keep it, after she thought we stole the stuff. Or maybe she thought we stole that one, too. Maybe Brody never gave it back. I'm not sure if it matters. We venture into the wind. As we film, I hear laughter and joyful screaming around me, the sound of a bunch of teenagers hanging out and having a good time. I wish it could always be like this. In this scene, Puppy's character is supposed to be holding my hand and crying. The storyline is that her infantry just got killed, and I'm the only one she has left to count on. When she grabs my hand, I almost forget that we're on camera. It's nothing really all that special. Feels just like holding hands should. But it is special. Her hand is soft and fits perfectly in mine. I catch a whiff of her perfume as she pulls me along. She's parading me around like some sort of pet, but I'm enjoying it. She's glad it's raining. Although the script calls for it, I think her tears are real. When the rain stops, it's nearly midnight and everybody has to go home. I head back inside and take a seat at the kitchen table. I wonder if I'll be able to finish the movie before the cops arrest me. Uncle Logan is sitting at the table as well, getting ready to go to work for third shift. I haven't eaten all day, but I'm not hungry. He takes a deep breath. Raz, I have to ask you a question, and I need you to answer honestly. Did you steal those cameras? The accusation hits me like a brick. To the face. Are you serious? I whisper, my mouth dropping open in disbelief. You think I did it? I'm not going to be mad. Just tell me the truth, he says flatly. You're my family. You're supposed to believe me, I say. I want to believe you, but Raz, you stole a car, he says in a tired voice. It's hard for me to trust you. I didn't steal a car, I say. I jump up and throw my chair back. Bethany stole it! Does it really make a difference? Yes! If I had known it was stolen, I wouldn't have driven it! And you know that! The phone rings. Aunt Sarah comes rushing in from the other room to answer, looking scared. Hello? Her terrified face falls into her relieved grin. She says, Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us know. She hangs up the phone and turns to us. One of the janitors moved all the boxes with the equipment to another room. They were planning to clean out the storage room, but forgot to tell anyone. It was all a silly misunderstanding. Aunt Sarah smiles. Great, Uncle Logan says, relieved. So the charges are dropped. I should be happy that I'm no longer accused of a crime and aren't at risk of going to prison. But I'm not. The fact that my own uncle thinks I'm turning back into the stupid kid I was over the summer hurts more than the thought of being locked up. No, it's not great, I say angrily. You didn't believe me when I said I didn't steal the cameras. I wanted to believe you, but you have to understand why I had my suspicions, he argues. No! You've been nothing but hard on me since I got here! I shout. Admit it, you think I'm a failure, just like my dad does! Raz. You want to send me away? Send me away! I say. 
Tears are forming at the corners of my eyes. I can't take this anymore. I don't want to stay here with you if you're going to accuse me of being a criminal. I'd rather be in the streets. At least there I know I'm not wanted. Raz. Uncle Logan wheezes before his eyes bug out of his head. He grabs his chest, gasps for breath, and then slumps onto the table. Aunt Sarah screams. I stare at him for a second, feeling like everything is in slow motion. Uncle Logan? I ask meekly. He falls to the floor. I try to catch him, but he's too heavy and he slumps out of my arms. I shake him to get him to say something, but he's completely unresponsive. His eyes rolled into the back of his head. Aunt Sarah is back on the phone, talking to 911. Hello? Yes, my husband has fainted. No, this can't be happening. My argument over my innocence can't have caused this. The death of this man lying in front of me. This is nothing like the movies. I want to do something to stop this, but I have no idea what. The only thing that I can do is sit here and watch as my uncle dies. I, the great, stupid raspberry sweet. Chapter 8 My hands are clasped. I'm sitting in a chair at the hospital, head bowed and body trembling. I've been like this for hours. I can't stand it anymore. Aunt Sarah has one arm wrapped around Mitzi, who's worn out. She sleeps against Aunt Sarah's side in the waiting room. As the night wears on, I throw my aunt the occasional glance. She rubs my back, trying to get me to calm down. But I will not calm down. Ever. Word has gotten around town, and my cell phone is packed with messages from my friends. Puppy has called three times. I haven't answered any of them. Uncle Logan took me in and has been a father to me ever since my dad tossed me to the side of the road. He didn't have to do that. I don't know why he did in the first place, because I'm such a massive fuck-up. What a role model I turned out to be for Mitzi. Why did my uncle want me anyway? I'm nothing all that special. Sure, I can act, but that's my only talent. I'm forgetful, loud, and a liar, not to mention a thief. I don't think before I act. That, more than anything, causes me and my clumsy self to fall flat on my face every time the ball is tossed my way. The door opens. I jump to my feet. A doctor faces Aunt Sarah. How is he? She asks. The doctor looks at his clipboard. It's hard to tell. He's going into surgery now. If all goes well, he should be fine. The doctor pauses. The heart attack was very sudden and quite severe. I just want you to be aware that there's only a 30% chance he'll pull through. You might want to start making preparations. Aunt Sarah turns completely white. I'll inform you if anything happens, the doctor says. The surgery will take a few hours. I suggest you try to eat and get some rest. The doctor goes back through the door, leaving us in the private waiting room. The tension is thicker than it was five minutes ago. Take this and go eat, Raz. Aunt Sarah pulls some money out of her purse and hands it to me. Take as long as you want. I'll feed Mitzi and myself when she wakes up. I take the money and stuff it in my pocket with no intention of using it, knowing that if I refuse it'll cause a fight, and I've given her more than enough pain for one day. I wander out of the unit and around the hospital, through random hallways. I go to the beautiful lobby with a flowing fountain and see the coins through the water at the bottom. My reflection turns my stomach, and I have to look away. The cafeteria is empty. I wouldn't go in there alone even if I was starving. It's too creepy. The gift shop has a lot of nice things, including a big balloon that fills up a whole corner. If Uncle Logan makes it through this, I'm buying him that balloon, I think. Down more stairs and up more elevators. I cross into the mental health unit and stagger around like one of our movie zombies, stunned. Excuse me, sir. A nurse grabs my arm and looks at me peculiarly. Do you need help finding your room? She thinks I'm a patient here. I shake my head and say, No, you've made a mistake. I don't belong here. Oh, I'm sorry, she says. 
She looks me over again, to try and decide if I'm lying, and says, If you get lost, just go to a desk and we can help you. Thanks, I mumble. I wander round and round, up and down stairs. Sometimes I run just to keep up with my thoughts. I eventually find the hospital chapel and look inside. It's small and dark. There's a tiny little book at the front of the chapel that people have written things in. Prayer requests and the like. I pick up the pen, ponder a moment, then scribble a few words. Dear God, you know who I am. I've screwed up. I gently place the pen down and turn to see a shadow in the doorway, a figure standing in the light. At first, I think it's an angel. You know, some sort of miracle worker to fix all the mistakes I've made. I start toward the beautiful creature slowly, trying to catch her face. But instead of an angel, I see Puppy. Once I recognize her, I throw myself at her. I can't stop myself from hugging her tightly. Right now, I just need to hold her. After a very long time, I tear my body away from her arms and ask, What are you doing here? You wouldn't answer our calls, she says. We all got together and decided somebody should show up. It was going to be Soldier at first, but then we voted on it, and we decided it should be me. I'm so glad they picked Puppy. I'm so, so glad. My friend grabs my arm and pulls me to a pew. We sit, and Puppy asks, Raz, how is your uncle doing? He had a major heart attack. He's in surgery now. She didn't ask how it had happened. I figured she must have found out from somebody else. She's quiet for a few seconds. Raz, why were you so afraid of going to prison? You knew they didn't have much to send you on. Do I look like the type of person who would survive in prison? I ask her. Because I'm not. Raz, you do fine, she says. You went to an arts academy. You could act your way out of prison so fast it wouldn't be funny. That's just a lie I told you guys to try and look cool. I mumble. Puppy hitches a breath. What? This is it. I'm done with lies. I decide to tell her the story. The whole story. I didn't go to an arts academy before I came to Limesville, I confess. I went to Ten York High, where I was the biggest outcast of the entire school. I was picked on every day by anyone who thought they could crack a joke, mostly by a bully named Cayman Markey. This is so hard to do. But in a way, it feels good, too. On the last day of school, he and a bunch of jocks surrounded me and started throwing raspberry cake at me until it was all over my face and my clothes. That's how I got my name. Raspberry Sweet. I spit the name sarcastically. Oh my god, she whispers. That's so terrible. But if Raz isn't your real name, what is it? Mildred. Oh, yeah. She says, nodding. I can see why you stuck with Raspberry. It's a lot better. Bethany was the one who stepped in to save me, I say. The only one. Now can you understand why I followed her around? She was the only person I knew who actually cared about me. Not even my parents put any effort to pretend they wanted me around. But, Puppy says, but you seemed so confident on your first day at Limesville High. You didn't seem like you cared about what anyone thought. I didn't have a choice. If I showed people who I really am, I would get outcasted again. And I knew I couldn't survive that. Not a second time. I sigh and look at her. But something happened here at Limesville. I was pretending to be Raspberry Sweet. Pretending to be this character in order to impress you and everyone else. But along the way, I became Raspberry Sweet. By acting like him, I turned into someone who was confident and sure of himself. But why would you need to do that? Why do you feel the need to hide behind a persona so badly? She asks. She still doesn't understand. How can I make her comprehend why I feel the way I do? It clicks into place. The answer is something I hate, but need to do. I swallow. I'm going to tell you something. Something I've never told anyone. Please don't freak out. Okay, Puppy says slowly. What is it? I'm shaking. 
the words are physically painful to say. Cayman didn't just humiliate me in front of the entire school. One day after community service, he chased me into a warehouse, beat me up, and then I can't finish. Puppy begins to cry. They're not broken tears. They're furious, terrible tears. Tears that stream from a fountain of rage. I come closer and say, No, oh, no, puppy, please don't cry. Puppy's face is scrunched up as she puts her head in her hands. This is so unfair to you. This is so unfair. Why didn't you tell me sooner? I didn't tell anyone. This is the first time I've actually admitted it out loud to myself. I was too afraid to tell anyone, I confess. She wipes the tears from her face quickly. That's absolutely terrible. I'm so sorry that happened to you, Raz. That's why I sank so far into Raspberry Sweet, I say. It was a tool I used to avoid facing what happened to me. But now it's just gotten me into trouble. Again. Your uncle's heart attack wasn't your fault. It was probably coming for a long time, she says. Yeah, but I didn't help, that's for sure, I grumble. Your uncle's going to be fine, she says. And even though you lied to me, to all of us, I'm not mad about it. I can see why you did it. Really? I say, surprised. Yeah, I just want you to promise that you won't act fake again. That from now on, you'll be who you really are. She smiles at me before extending her hand. That's what real friends do. You promise? I promise. I shake her hand, but when we're done, I don't let go. Puppy pulls her hand out of mine, slowly. The first thing we have to do is to get some food into you. You look famished. You'll never get anything into me. Not after this, I say weakly. I will if I have to force it down your throat. She smiles. Move it, Raz. Yes, madam. I pretend to give her a bow, and she elbows me in the gut. We start toward the cafeteria. Now that puppy's beside me, the hospital doesn't seem creepy and absent anymore. It seems fresh and full of life. We've only got one more scene on the movie to film, she states randomly. Wizard is putting it all together. We were going to finish up the movie and surprise you, until we looked at the last scene and realized you were in it. We couldn't do it without you. Of course not, I say. I ruffle my hair for the first time in days. After all, what would you do without your handsome, dashing, raspberry sweet to make everyone else look good? More like blow up the screen with your egotistical hot air, Puppy teases. I laugh. Even in the worst of circumstances, Puppy always knows what to say to make me smile. Puppy miraculously manages to get some food into my stomach before the end of the night. Her phone vibrates, and she answers it after I'm done nibbling on my meal. It's her mom. I have to go, she says. She stands up and gives me a hug. My parents are waiting for me outside. Tell them thanks, you know, I say, for letting you come. She smiles and waves a farewell. I notice she takes her time going out the door. Once she leaves, a cold iciness fills my heart again. But this time, it's different. Puppy has given me a small spurt of hope, and if I can hold on to it until I know what's going to happen to my uncle, then that's all the better. I don't feel like going back into the waiting room just yet. It's only been a few hours, and I'm not sure if I'm ready to face whatever's waiting for me. I begin heading that way, though, wandering my way past aisles and doors in a slow pace. My eyes travel from a painting of the sea next to a desk, a nurse drinking water from a bottle, a long-haired blonde in a bed. A long-haired blonde? No, it can't be. I poke my head around the wall, feeling rude for disturbing somebody's privacy, especially someone that I don't know. But my stomach drops as I realize this is someone I know. She's hooked up to an IV, is lying under a thin blanket, and is half asleep, looking pale as death. I'd recognize her anywhere. Bethany. Chapter 9 My head tells me to run away from her as fast as possible, 
but my heart causes my body to gravitate toward hers. I don't know if she wants me here. Is she going to be mad at me still? Why do I even want to see her? Her veined eyelids open slowly as she hears my footsteps. She looks at me for a long time before the corners of her mouth turn upward. She whispers, Raspberry sweet. That's me, I say dryly. I look at all the tubes stuck in her hand and ask, Why are you in here? I thought you went to juvie. I overdosed, she coughs. <laughs> Somebody snuck in heroin and I wanted to try it. I want to feel disgusted with her, but I can't. I just feel sorry for her. She looks up at the ceiling and says, So, what brings you here? My uncle had a heart attack. That sucks, she says quietly. She takes a shallow breath and says, Sit down, Ress. I almost don't. I nearly walk out right then, but I take the chair by her bedside and sit down. I'm shocked to see how papery her skin looks. Enjoying your stay? I ask. No, she says. I'll be out in a few days. But I'm planning on getting more drugs before I go back to juvie. She smiles past her exhaustion. Do you really want to know what I think? I say abruptly. Bethany's smile is gone. I already do, Raz. I can see it in your eyes. Well, you're going to want to hear it anyway. I take a deep breath. I really wanted you to do better, Bethany. You could have. You were my best friend. Fear setting in as I look at her. I see her broken body and imagine myself in her place, falling apart inch by inch and not even caring. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to end up like her. But I see how easily I could. She says, simply as a statement, You're pretty selfish, Raz. After I got arrested, you didn't call or write or anything. Not even once. You're pretty selfish, too. You didn't try to contact me, either. I shoot back. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know, she scoffs. I know I'm selfish, but I didn't think that you were. I leaned back in surprise. Bethany had never criticized her own faults before. If anything, she had exalted them. Something slams into me. For as much as Bethany brags about not caring what anyone thinks of her, she really, really cares about what I think. It's a testament to how good of friends we were. How much she loved me, and I her. The truth is, back then, Bethany wasn't a bad person. I wasn't either. We were just two broken kids who didn't have anyone that looked out for them, so we had to look out for each other. Why don't you ever plan anything out? You always act on impulse, I ask. Maybe if I had a crystal ball and could look into the future, I'd know what to do with myself. I'm bad at making good choices, she replies helplessly. I'm not made of magic grass. I look at the floor. Funny, there was a time that I thought you were. They say forgive and forget. I forgive, Bethany who's wasting away in front of me. She has no desire to do anything but try to get an escape from the pain. It's harder to forgive myself. She shifts on the bed and says, You know, Raz, I look at you, and I look at me, and all I see is the bad stuff people have done to us. Why does there have to be so much bad in the world, Raz? She's tearing up. You believe in God? I don't. There are facts all around us about God not being real. I learned that when my dad left. If there's a God, where is he? If he cares so much about me, why didn't he make my dad stay? A tear slips out of her eye. All I ever wanted was for him to love me. I don't have an answer for her. Instead, I take her hand and say, I don't know where God is or why he doesn't stop some of the terrible things in this world. All I know is that I still care about you, even though you really messed things up between us. But I gotta say, I had a hand in that too. Maybe at the end of the day, there really is nobody to blame. She grins. 
You were always a softy, raspberry sweet. I look at her, and she looks at me. Neither of us have much more to say. I let go of her hand and stand up. You could set this right if you want. If you don't, nobody's going to be able to help you. Maybe you'll fix yourself, Bethany. I hope so. I want to be friends again. <laughs> Hopefully, we can. She laughs. A sigh escapes from her lips. She's slipping off to sleep. I hate the feeling I get when I close the door. When I leave the room, something in me knows that I won't see Bethany ever again. The surgery has to be over by now. With a tightness in my chest, I travel back to the waiting room. I open the door and someone runs into me. Aunt Sarah. She's crying, enveloping both Mitzi and I in a big hug. So, this is how it ends. He's dead. Tears leak out of my eyelids. I smash into her coat, trying to block out the outside world. Razzie, why are you crying? Mitzi asks. I bite my lip. Aunt Sarah glimpses my face and says, Raz, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? I hoarsely ask. Uncle Luke instead. He's gone. No, he's fine. Aunt Sarah grins happily. He just got out of surgery. The doctor came to tell us he made it through. The operation was a success. <laughs> but you were crying and upset, I protest. Those were tears of relief, silly. Aunt Sarah laughs. She puts an arm around my shoulder and says, We can go see him tomorrow when he wakes up. He barely made it, but you know, Logan, he's a determined man. I hardly think that when he was on the operating table he told them not to mess it up, I say sarcastically but laugh. My grief is fading to panic now. What will Uncle Logan say to me when he finally sees me? Is he going to be mad at me? I think we'll wait until the afternoon to visit, Aunt Sarah adds. The doctor said to let him recover. What are we supposed to do until then, I ask. Mitzi smiles and grabs my hand. I think I have an idea. The sunlight streaming in through the cracks of the old barn. Despite staying up all night, I feel fine and I'm ready to get this show on the road. School's been cancelled today. Nobody knows why and nobody really cares enough to find out. I still have bags under my eyes and my hair is messy, but for the most part, I'm awake. My tired appearance simply helps the fact that my character is dying in this scene. After sacrificing himself to a horde of zombies, my character is forced to give one last goodbye to Theophania before he dies in her arms. Classic Ola and Perry. I rip up some old clothes to make me look more gruesome. Mamie smears on the fake blood as Ola comes up to me and says, We changed the script at the last minute. Read it over and report to Pepper ASAP. I take it from her and look through it quickly. Nothing appears any different from the last time I looked at it. Except... there. In nice, italic letters, it's been added that me and Puppy kiss at the end of the scene. Kiss. Not on the cheek. On the lips. For a full minute. My legs feel weak. I've got to grab onto the side of the wall to keep from falling to the floor. I throw the script at Pepper and ask, What's this? My point exactly, Puppy asks. She's already finished putting on her costume. She looks pretty mad, pointing right to the place in the script where we're supposed to lock lips. You're kissing. So what? Pepper asks. So what? Raz and I aren't together! Puppy shouts. You aren't, but your characters are. Get with the program! Pepper motions for Dawn to fix a prop that's hanging on the loft. I refuse, Puppy says, and she crosses her arms. We're not asking you to have sex. It's only a little kiss, Pepper protests. You've got to give the audience what they want, and what they want is a romance. This movie can either be great or it can be sucky. One little kiss isn't going to make much of a difference, Puppy argues. On the contrary, it makes all the difference. What are you so worried about if it's only one little kiss? Pepper asks. She leaves to check in on how Brody's setting up the camera. Puppy and I glance at each other, then quickly look away. I say, If I didn't know any better, I would think Perry and Ola did this on purpose. So would I, Puppy snarls. She's pretty irritated, but at least it's not with me. I really hope she doesn't blow a fuse and stomp out of here, seeing as she's the star. I lean in and say, 
We've worked really hard on this movie. We're best friends. It's not like it means anything. Let's just go for it. Her expression softens as she grabs my hand softly. Only for you, Raz. We nod at each other. I go for my last costume check, but Puppy says, Wait! I turn. She lowers her voice even more and asks, Will it be your first time? Yeah, I admit. I've never kissed anyone before. She looks down at the floor and says, Me too. Rolling in five, people! Pepper shouts. Ola dusts off my jacket and says I'm going to do great. By now, everybody knows about our kiss. Soldier walks by. He winks, saying, Don't mess it up, Raz. Zor smiles knowingly at me. With limbs made of water, I take my place. Any second now, I'm going to jump out of my skin. I can't concentrate. I'm so nervous. My first kiss. And in front of everyone, too. On camera. I just want to get it over with. I can tell Puppy's freaking out. Neither of us have any idea how to do this. I can't believe I'm acting like this when kids younger than we are have a go at it every day. I see people making out in the halls all the time, and I've watched it in movies. What makes this so different? Action! Brody shouts. I push my thoughts aside and decide that this isn't the time or place to be a coward. I spring into action and toss around my fellow students dressed as zombies, though they're overpowering me. For the first time, I can't concentrate on my acting. Every thought is dedicated to the task ahead. God, I hope I don't mess up. What if I slobber too much? What if... Oh no. What if I suck at kissing and I don't know it? Puppy comes in. It's now or never. A thought comes to my mind. What if we have to do this scene again? What if we mess it up and we have to keep refilming and kissing over and over? I can't do that to her. It would completely humiliate her. This take has to be absolutely perfect. All the zombies attack me all at once. I shout and fake my horror exquisitely while Puppy screams hysterically in the background. Would she really react that way if I was dying in real life? Puppy brings out her fake gun and starts batting people around. She screams again as she sees me lying there, bleeding and gasping. She falls to her knees and grabs my hand. She raises my head up off the ground. She mutters a few lines of strained dialogue. Why are you leaving me? She whispers. Why do you have to go? I clear my throat. That's just how life is, Theophania. People die. Not you, she chokes. Not now. Yes, I wheeze. I just want you to know, I've always loved you. Always. It's the moment. We pause for about two seconds, then take the plunge. As our lips touch, I realize that the movies are completely wrong. There's absolutely no way to portray this. No way to convey how wonderful this kiss feels. You could film a million movies, shoot a million kiss scenes a million times, and it would never compare to the real thing. Puppy tastes incredible. I could make out with her for days and not get tired, not get bored. Her mouth is a live wire against mine, and something new that I haven't experienced burns within me. I want more. I want all of her. In the moment, I feel like I can't live without her. Puppy breaks away first. Her expression is confused, distant. She won't look me in the eye. I remember I'm supposed to be dead. I slump in her arms, and she lets out a wild scream. Just like that, the movie we've been working on for weeks is over. The room breaks into wild cheers and applause. I get up, take Puppy's hand, and bow to the crowd. I smile at her. A natural friend responds. She smiles back, though I can tell behind her smile she's figuring something out. That was great acting, Raz! Real professional! Mamie congratulates as I come off screen. I smile. She doesn't know that I wasn't really acting. The feelings were real. I don't say anything, though. It's best to stay quiet, for now. In all reality, I'm not sure how quiet this is going to stay. I hope nobody noticed how much I was enjoying it. With a jolt, I realized that my very first kiss just happened. Okay, people, I shout. I've got an uncle in the hospital to visit. 
Quit loitering around my house and somebody get the tape to Wizard so we can edit this thing. Right away, Raz, Brody calls. As people begin to file out, I notice someone's missing. Puppy's already left. She'll be back, Pepper says, patting me on the shoulder when she notices my fallen expression. She always comes back to you. Chapter 10 Despite my crazy experience this morning, I'm still anxious to see Uncle Logan in the afternoon. I go in last to see him, tagging along the giant balloon from the hospital gift shop. It gets stuck in the door. I nearly fall flat on my face as I shove it into the room, catching my balance at the last minute. The room is white, crisp, and clean. I peek around the wall curtain and look around, wondering how he looks. Amazingly, he isn't too bad. He doesn't look anything like Bethany, anyway. I heard she'd been sent to another hospital closer to her mother. Sure, he's a little pale and in need of a shave, and the hospital gown's too tight around his massive biceps, but for the most part, he looks pretty good for having a heart attack. I creep inside, drape my jacket over the side of a chair, and tie the balloon to his bedside. He looks up and smiles at it, and then at me. Hi, Uncle Logan. I grimace, feeling awful. How are you? Ah, oh, fine. I'd be better if I could get out of this damn bed, he complains. I look down. I'm sorry. I feel really bad about what happened. It wasn't your fault, he says immediately. The doctor told me months ago that I needed to take better care of my heart, and I didn't listen. It wasn't because of our fight. It was going to happen sooner or later. But I started it, I say. Let it go, Rash. It's over. I pause. I've been dying to ask him this question since I heard he woke up, but is now really the right time? Why did you take me in? I ask. The words come out of my mouth before I decide to say them. What? He asks, completely flabbergasted. When my parents kicked me out, why did you let me live with you? You knew I wasn't any good. You aren't a bad person, Raz, Uncle Logan says. Someone had to give you a chance. I knew my brother wasn't going to, even if he gave you life. But no matter what, I always believed in you. But why? My own parents don't want me, I say. There's a lump forming in my throat. Your father wanted to mold you into something he wanted you to be, Uncle Logan says. But I wanted you to turn into the man you wished to become, on your own terms. I thought if I took you in, maybe you'd find yourself. And I think you have. A thickness forms in my throat. Yeah, I think I have too. The sun's starting to set. Outside the hospital is a large yellow field and a trashed, abandoned yard with a big, white canvas. What's that? I whisper to myself, not really intending for Uncle Logan to hear. That's the old drive-in, Uncle Logan says tiredly. It's abandoned, but the screen is still there. People go there and play movies when they're bored. A smile begins to spread slowly across my face. A few weeks later, more than 50 cars are parked in the abandoned lot. The crew and I spent the entire weekend cleaning up the old drive-in, mowing the lawn and picking up the trash, and getting permission from the town to use the property. We painted lines in the grass for parking spots so people could watch the movie from their cars. We're going to project the film onto the old canvas. The sky's wide open, night's beginning to fall. Anxiety flutters in my chest. I've watched the movie twice already. Wizard and I went through it over and over, and made sure there were no technical mistakes or errors of any kind. When we were certain it was as good as we could make it, we showed it to the crew, corrected what we missed, then tried it again. Needless to say, Wizard and I had been spending a lot of time together. We hope it's ready, but art is to be abandoned, not completed, so we hoped we got everything and planned to let our baby fly. Practically everyone I know is here. Aunt Sarah is helping Uncle Logan along, who's now using a cane. There are way more kids from the high school here than I had expected. There are even people from out of town. Our crews worked hard to post flyers and spread the word. Don and Brody are setting up the projector now. We have a backup in case it breaks. Various scenarios of everything that could possibly go wrong are running through my head. I jump when I feel a hand on my shoulder, but see that it's only Soldier, along with Pepper, Zor, and Puppy. 
The five of us take a seat on the grass and look up. Pepper brought popcorn, and one of the clubs at the school decided to jump on the bandwagon and sell refreshments. I know not to have anything with caffeine. I'm wired enough as it is. As a group, we decided to sell tickets and give the funds to a local charity. Mamie sitting with a gaggle of her friends. All of them are waving at me in a flirty way. I wave back weakly, and the music starts to play. The talking stops, and everything goes silent. This is it. I can't believe it, but here I am, sitting here with all my friends and watching our movie. We look the same up on screen, but by the way people are gazing at us, you'd think we were big movie stars. There's gasping and laughing at all the right places, and sometimes there are reactions that I don't expect. I have to marvel at the special effects, which look even better on the big screen. The kissing scene comes up fast. The magical lines are set on screen. I turn to look at Puppy. She glances at me. Our eyes connect for a few long seconds. Then it happens. People start wolf whistling. I blush and duck down from all the stairs. Zor, Soldier, and Pepper are giving me hell. Puppy, like me, is hiding her hat. I peer over to see Mamie's reaction. She seems upset. Weird. Finally, it's over. People jump to their feet to give us a standing ovation. They love it, I say to myself, shocked. They actually love it. We did good, people, Pepper murmurs, totally patting herself on the back. We did good. Did you see me, Mommy? Mitzi asks as my family ventures over to me. Yes, honey, I did, Aunt Sarah praises. She nods to me and says, That was very well done. I'm impressed, Raz. You should take up acting as a career. Really? I ask, heart leaping. Uncle Logan claps a hand on my shoulder and says, You really do have talent, Raz. You should follow your dream. Puppy taps on my arm. I turn to look at her. She bashfully looks at the ground, saying, We looked pretty cool up there, didn't we? We did, I say. Maybe the crowd will want an encore. She punches me in the arm and laughs. Don't flatter yourself. My friends gather together, talking loudly and congratulating each other. I go to join them, but before I can, I see Mamie crying behind a Chevy. I walk over to where she is and ask, Hey, what's wrong? She looks up. She seems happy to see me. Oh, it's you, Raz. I'm just... I have allergies, you know? Oh, okay. She draws closer. We really blew the audience away. Everyone thought this was just going to be some dumb high school thing, and you made it real. It was your idea. You're responsible for all of this. No, I shake my head. I couldn't have done it without everyone's help. She chuckles. You're so brilliant, Raz. So talented. No, I'm not. I chuckle lowly. I'm nowhere near it. You are, she whispers. You just don't see it. I keep quiet. She walks a little closer, and I nearly back away. She's almost too close. But then I remember everything I told her in detention, and realize she never told anybody. All those secrets, and Mamie never said a word. My trust increases. She beckons for me to lean down so she can whisper in my ear. I do so, and she says, You know, I love the way you smile. It's so funny. Slowly, before I know it's happening, Mamie leans in and gives me a tiny kiss on the cheek. She sneaks away silently. Bye, Raz, she whispers. I'll see you around. She walks away. I have no idea where she's going. To tell her friends that she kissed me, probably. Or not. You never know. Mamie's a good secret keeper. Late that night, after everyone's gone home, the celebration party is over. It's long past midnight, so I go for a walk. My sneakers crunch on the gravel road as I walk away from the drive-in to a hill overlooking the area. I gaze at the stars and think about Puppy and how pretty she would look under them right now. There's an old oak tree with a swing dangling from the branches. I sit on it and contemplate things, swinging back and forth like I used to when I was a little kid. In the same way that I don't want to think about my past, I don't want to think about my future. I'm still stuck between questions of, 
What do you want to do when you grow up? And what are you going to do with your life? I swing slower. Now, I know. I don't need to do something or be something in order to be somebody. I'm already worth life. Worth living. I never needed to prove that. Bethany taught me that, in a way. But more importantly, I've taught myself. I can't think about how I want to become a real actor, or wonder what Bethany's doing right now. I don't even want to dream a puppy, though the thought's tempting. I just want to know if I'm alright. Am I alright? Did I put myself back together after what happened to me? So many times I had hoped it was all just made up in my head, that I'd gone insane. Yet there's no running away from it now. The truth is real, and it hurts. I can't forget the reality, though I've tried to. But I'm not powerless anymore. There's a part of me that's always going to be broken. But that part's a lot smaller than before. I lean back on the swing and turn my face to the stars. I'm an actor, sure, but I'm way more than that. I'm different from everyone else, sure. But what's so special about being different anyway? Everybody's different, in their own way. One thing I'm sure of. I'm anything but ordinary. And finally, tonight, I'm coming to terms with that. These thoughts were nothing more than just musings from an outcast. But I'm not such an outcast anymore. I've come to accept me. And if I'm willing to accept who I am, I don't need the approval of anybody else. I don't hate myself anymore. My past can no longer destroy who I am. After the worst summer and the best school year of my life, I'm finally happy. Me, Raspberry Sweet. The End Raz's story continues in Save Me, Yours Truly, Raspberry Sweet, Raspberry Sweet Book 2. This has been anything but the musings of an outcast. Me, Raspberry Sweet. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by A.J. Carter. Copyright 2011 by Megan Linsky. Audio copyright 2023 by Megan Linsky.